you'd sleep, she said. You should probably still be in hospital. She leaned to one side and spat again, less delicately this time. Shit, what is this? You eat a pound of muck before you die, I said. This time, she let her hands fall onto her lap and turned round to me. What? Dad again. He got it from his dad. It's called a Wiltshire Wisdom. When I was young, I took it literally. You know, imagined that when I'd eaten exactly my pound of muck, that would be it. Curtains, even if I was only seven and healthy as a horse. It terrified me for a while. I used to scrub fruit till I bruised it. One time I even tried to use bleach on a biscuit I dropped on the floor. Helen was staring at me. I dropped my eyes to the floor, feeling ridiculous. Are you okay? she asked tentatively, as though not too sure she could deal with an honest answer. I nodded without looking up. You're allowed to have a good howl. I did. I bit my lip. Took a deep breath. Not sure I'd be able to stop. I managed after a second or two. Helen said nothing, but I could feel her staring at me. Duncan's leaving me, I said. He's met someone else. I suppose I should be thankful, really, given everything that's. Helen started to push herself up from the desk to come towards me. When can you phone for a helicopter? I asked. She said nothing for a second, then sat back down. An hour or so, not too long. I forced myself to concentrate on the papers in front of me. After a minute or two, I was able to blink away the tears and read them. Right at the start of Dana's investigation, I'd given her a printout of births on the islands. She'd transferred it all onto her laptop, but had kept my original, and I was looking at it now. She'd gone over several entries with a pink highlighter pen. The four highlighted entries were all births that had taken place on Tronal between March and August 2005. I'd done exactly the same thing some hours previously. Again, I noticed the initials KT. Seven entries. What had Gifford said they abbreviated? Keloid trauma. It had made a certain sort of sense the way he'd explained it, but it wasn't a term I'd come across before. Wondering if the entries had anything else in common, I checked the timing and found nothing. They were spread fairly evenly over the six-month period. Next, I checked locality. Three had been born at the Franklin Stone, another elsewhere in Lerwick, one on Yell, one on Bresse, and one on Papa Stewer. The weights of the infants varied, but all were within the normal range, if anything, slightly on the heavy side. A couple had been caesareans, but the rest were normal vaginal deliveries. They were all boys. I checked again. Not a single girl among them. Race of males. I'd had it. I settled myself down on the straw and drew my jacket up around me. My consciousness closed down, just about the same moment my eyes did. Dora didn't want to wake up; knew I had to. Dora, firmer this time, like Mum on a school day, had to be done. I pushed myself up. Helen was standing over me. The door to the tack room was open, and it was light outside. Helen had packed both bags. And had one slung over each shoulder. We have to leave, she said. Can you walk a mile? I stood up. Speaking seemed like too much effort, so I didn't try. I drank some water, scribbled a note to my friend, and then walked out into the sunlight. Helen locked up behind me, and replaced the key. I glanced over to where Charles and Henry were grazing, and felt as though I was leaving my children behind. Helen set off towards the yard gate, and I followed. She held it open for me. We started to walk down the road towards the tiny town of Vaux. My shoulder blades felt as though someone had put a knife in between them, 
and my legs were shaking. I was light-headed again, but this time with exhaustion and lack of food rather than panic. I hadn't the energy left to panic. Where are we going? I asked. I looked at my watch. 5.30 a.m. Pub at the bottom, Helen replied. There's a car park. Chopper can land there. In spite of everything, I was impressed. She was going to get us out of here. I'd be safe. I could rest. We could work it all out. Or maybe I'd let someone else do it. Maybe I didn't really care too much any more. We heard the chopper when we were still about a quarter mile from the pub, and I had to fight an urge to run and hide. Helen, what if it's not your people? What if it's them? What if they tracked your phone call? Calm down. If that sort of technology even exists outside the movies, it's certainly not in common use. The noise of the chopper was getting louder. Helen took my arm and frog-marched me across the street and into the car park. The helicopter was overhead now. It started to circle. I looked round. There was no one in sight, but it was only a matter of minutes before the noise of the helicopter's engines would draw the curious. Someone would phone the local police. They would come and check. Slowly the helicopter began its descent. It continued to circle around the car park, getting lower with each circuit. In the street, a delivery van had pulled over. A woman walking two lurchers approached. The dog started to bark, but instead of moving them away from the noise, she stopped and watched, shading her eyes against the early sun. The helicopter, small, black and yellow, not unlike the one the medical team used to get around the islands in emergencies, was about fifty feet above us now, and the wind from the blades whipped my hair up around my head. Helen, still plaited, stayed put. A car had pulled over now, and two men jumped out to watch. One of them was speaking into a mobile. Come on! Finally, the chopper touched down. The pilot signaled to Helen, she took my arm, and we ran towards it. Helen opened the door, I jumped into the back seat and she followed, closing the door behind her. We were in the air before either of us could even locate our seat belts, let alone fasten them. Helen yelled something at the pilot that I didn't catch. He shouted back and then swung the chopper round. We were heading south, back over Shetland. I really didn't care, just as long as when we put down again we were off the islands. Helen smiled at me, patted my hand and then raised her eyebrows and nodded her head in an everything-all-right sort of gesture. Speech was just about impossible, so I nodded. She settled back in her seat and closed her eyes. The helicopter bounced around as it sped south. Neither Helen nor I had been offered headphones, and the engines were painfully loud. I started to feel nauseous and looked around for a sick bag. Saliva gathered in my mouth, and I closed my eyes. Helen had said nothing, but I guessed we were going to Dundee, where she was based. On her own patch, she would have the best use of resources, and be better able to look after me if, or rather when, Dunn and his gang came after me. After a while, the nausea faded, and I risked opening my eyes again. Another ten, fifteen minutes passed, and I was feeling well enough to watch the coastline go by. In the early sun, the sea sparkled, and the white of the foam had turned to silver. The first time I saw Duncan had been at the coast. He'd been surfing, and was walking out of the water, board tucked under one arm, his wet hair gleaming black, eyes bluer than the sky. I hadn't dared approach, thinking him way out of my league. But later that night, he'd found me. I'd thought myself the luckiest girl in the world. So what did that make me now? There were a dozen questions that I really didn't want answers to, but I just couldn't get them out of my head. How deep did Duncan's involvement go? Had he known about Melissa? Had we bought the house so that he could keep an eye on the place, 
make sure nothing disturbed the anonymous grave on the hillside? I couldn't believe it, would not believe it, but... Soon Dundee drew nearer, and I prepared myself for the stomach-sinking, ear-popping descent. Instead, the pilot banked sharp right and headed west. We left Dundee behind us and started to gain altitude. A minute later I glanced down and realised why. The Grampian Mountains were directly below. I've probably made it clear already that I'm not a great fan of Scotland, particularly the north-eastern corner of it. But even I have to admit that if there's anywhere on earth more beautiful than the Scottish Highlands, I have yet to see it. I watched those peaks sail below us, some capped with snow, some with heather. I saw glinting sapphires of lochs, and forests so deep and thick you might expect to find dragons in them, and I started to feel better. The pain between my shoulders became an ache, and when I looked down, my hands were no longer shaking. When we could see the sea again, the helicopter at last started to go down. Helen opened her eyes when we were twenty feet from the ground. We put down on a football field. Fifty yards away sat a blue and white police car. My heart started to thud, but Helen didn't bat an eyelid. She yelled something at the pilot and then jumped out. I followed and we ran to the police car. The constable in the driving seat started the engine. "'Morning, Nigel,' said Helen. "'Morning, ma'am,' he replied. "'Where to first? "'The harbour, please,' replied Helen. "'We drove through a small greystone town that looked vaguely familiar. "'When we arrived at the harbour, I realised where we were. "'A few years ago, Duncan and I had taken part in a flotilla cruise "'of the Highlands Whiskey Distilleries. "'The week-long junket had begun in this town, "'and I remembered a drunken, wonderful evening. "'It felt like a very long time ago.' Helen gave the driver some directions, and we drove along the harbour front, stopping just short of the pier, for no reason I could see. We got out. Helen led me to one of the small stalls that line the front of most seaside towns. Do you like seafood? she asked. Not usually for breakfast, I replied. Trust me, do you like seafood? I guess, I said, thinking what the hell... A good chuck-up will at least get rid of the nausea. Helen pointed out a bench overlooking the sea, and I sat down. I could smell the sour, slightly rancid aroma of sun-dried seaweed and the leftovers of yesterday's catch. And something wonderful. Helen sat down beside me, handing me a large cardboard mug of coffee, several white paper napkins, and a grease-stained paper bag. Lobster bap, she said smugly. Fresh caught this morning. It was an incredible breakfast. The bitter, rich strength of the coffee worked like medicine. The softness of the fresh, white bread, dripping with salty, warm butter and coating my lips with flour like fine talcum powder. And the lobster, rich and sweet, every mouthful a feast in itself. Helen and I, ate as though we were racing, and by a fraction of a second, I won. I'd have given anything to have stayed there, drinking coffee as the sun rose in the sky and the sea turned from silver to a rich, deep blue, watching the tide go out and the fishing boats come in. But the clock was ticking. The world was waking up, and I knew Helen hadn't brought me to Oban just for breakfast. As though reading my mind, she looked at her watch. 7.45, she said. I'd say that's a respectable enough time for house calls. She stood up, brushed herself down, and held out her hand for my empties. Back in the car, she turned to me. OK, listen good, because we'll be there in a minute. While you were in the land of Nod last night, I had another look at Gare Carter Gow's bank accounts, to see if I could find anything else out of the ordinary. There are six client accounts in total. I found references to your husband's firm, to the hospital where you work, and to Tronal. 
but Dana hadn't cross-referenced anything else, and there was nothing to compare with the amounts of money supposedly being moved around by Schiller drilling. Are you with me? Yep, so far. We'd left the harbour and were winding our way through Oban's residential streets. Nigel, the driver, pulled over to check a street map. That's not to say there's nothing there, just that it needs more digging than I had time for last night. OK. We were on the move again. Then I started going through the commercial account statements. Again, nothing really stood out. Checks and cash are banked most days, but there's no real detail on where the money is coming from. We'd need to go through their books to find that. There's a fairly large payroll that goes out monthly and various direct debits to the utility companies. Money also comes in monthly from a few clients who have the firm on retainer. All things you might expect? The car had slowed down. We turned into a cul-de-sac of newish, detached houses. Nigel was peering at house numbers. Right. But when I was going through Gare Carter Gow's Oban account, which I left to last, by the way, something did stand out. Here we are, ma'am, said Nigel. Number 14. Thanks. Give us a minute, said Helen. Three payments from the Oban commercial account to something called the Cathy Morton Trust. I noticed them partly because of their size. They amounted to half a million in sterling in total. And this wasn't a client account, remember. This was coming from Gare Carter Gow's own money. The other thing that got my attention was the timing. Over Helen's shoulder, I could see curtains moving. A small face was watching us from a downstairs window of number 14. Three payments in September and October 2004. The second of them on the 6th of October 2004. I said nothing, just looked back at her, waiting for the punchline. Helen looked disappointed. I'd obviously missed something. So, then I got back on the internet and called up a national police register. Only one record of a Cathy Morton in Oban, and this was her last known address. Come on, they've seen us. You too, Nigel, please. You'll need your notebook. We got out of the car and walked up the drive to the front door. Helen knocked. The door was opened quickly by a man in his late thirties, dressed in a suit that needed pressing, and a blue shirt open at the neck. A small boy in Spider-Man pyjamas peered at us from around the door frame. Helen flashed her badge and introduced Nigel and me. The man glared at us both. Mr. Mark Salter? asked Helen. His head jerked forwards. We need to talk to you and your wife. May we come in? Salter didn't move. She's in bed, he said. Another child, a girl this time, had joined her brother. They watched us with the unabashed curiosity of the extremely young. Please ask her to join us, said Helen, moving forward. Salter had a choice, step back or or go nose to nose with a senior police officer. He made the sensible decision, and we were inside. Salter muttered something about getting his wife up and disappeared upstairs. We went into the living room. The TV was tuned into CBeebies. The kids, aged about seven and three, seemed mesmerised by us. Hi, said Helen, addressing the boy. You must be Jamie. The boy said nothing. Helen tried the girl. Hello, Kirsty. Kirsty, a cute little thing with porcelain skin and bright red hair, turned and ran from the room. We heard footsteps on the stairs as Mark Salter and his wife returned. Kirsty ran in behind them. The woman had obviously dressed in a hurry, pulling on jogging pants and a crumpled T-shirt. Over one shoulder she held a small baby, about four weeks old. I'm Caroline Salter, she said, as Kirsty clung to her legs. I have to be at work in fifteen minutes, said Mark Salter. You'll find being questioned by the police counts as a pretty good excuse, said Helen. She glanced at the children and lowered her voice as she looked at Caroline Salter. 
I need to talk to you about your sister. The woman reached down and pulled Kirsty firmly away from her legs. She spoke to the boy, and her voice brooked no argument. Come on, you two, breakfast! She looked at her husband, and he led the children from the room, switching off the TV as he went, and closing the door behind him. Caroline adjusted the baby and wrapped her hands more closely around him. My sister is dead, she said, lowering herself onto one of the sofas. Helen had been expecting that. She nodded. I know I'm very sorry. She looked round at the other sofa behind us and raised her arm in a may we gesture. The Salter woman nodded, and Helen and I sat down. Nigel perched on a chair by the window. There was no sign of his notebook. How are the children doing? asked Helen. Something in the woman's face softened. Okay, she said. They still have their bad days. It's harder for Jamie. Kirsty barely remembers her mum. Helen gestured towards the baby. This one is yours, she said. Caroline nodded. He's gorgeous, said Helen. Then she turned to me. Miss Hamilton here is an obstetrician, brings little ones like that into the world all the time. Caroline sat up straighter in the chair, and the wariness in her face gave way just a fraction to interest. I made myself smile. How are you getting on? I asked. She shrugged. Okay, I guess. It's tough. I mean, I'm used to kids, but babies are a whole new ball game. Tell me about it, I said, a tick of impatience starting to build in my head. The door opened. Mark Salter came back into the room and sat next to his wife. Beside me, Helen straightened herself up. Female empathy time was over. When did your sister become ill? asked Helen. Over at the window, Nigel had started scribbling. Caroline looked at her husband. He made a thinking face. She had a breast tumor removed about five years ago, he said. Christmas time. Jamie was just a toddler. Then she was okay for a while. But the cancer came back. Mark nodded. Doesn't it always? When exactly? Early in 2004, said Caroline. Kathy was pregnant with Kirsty, so she wouldn't have chemotherapy. By the time Kirsty was born, it had spread too much. The doctors weren't able to remove it, I asked. Caroline's eyes were looking moist. They tried, she said. She had an operation, but it wasn't successful. An open and shut case. She had chemo and radiotherapy, but in the end, just pain relief. She lived here with you? asked Helen. Caroline nodded. She couldn't manage the children. She couldn't do anything at the end. She was just in so much pain. Caroline started to cry, and the baby squawked in protest. Mark Salter took the opportunity to play the annoyed husband. Oh, great! We really don't need this right now. Are you through yet? He didn't do it terribly well. He looked more afraid than angry. Not quite, sir, said Helen, who hadn't been convinced either. I want to ask you about the Cathy Morton Trust. I assume you're both trustees. Mark nodded. Yes, us two and our solicitor, he replied. And that would be Mr. Gare? Yes, that's right. Should I be speaking to him about this? I doubt you'd be able to get hold of him right now. When did Cathy meet Stephen Gare? Husband and wife looked at each other. I want to know what this is about, he began. I think you know already, Mr. Salter. It's about the money your sister-in-law received from Mr. Gare. It's not our money, said Caroline. We can't spend any of it. It's for the kids. Mark Salter stood up. Behind him, Nigel did too. We've got nothing more to say. I'd like you to leave, please. Helen stood up. Assuming we were going, I did too. 
Mr. Salter, at this moment I have no reason to suspect you or your wife of any wrongdoing, but I can and will arrest you for obstruction of justice if you don't start cooperating. There was silence for a moment. Then Helen sat down again. Feeling a bit daft, I did too. Salter hovered for a second, then lowered himself back down beside his frightened wife. Baby Salter was seriously creating now. Caroline fumbled under her sweatshirt and released a large breast. She lowered the baby and he started rooting towards the large, cracked nipple. Salter shot a black look at his wife. You tell them, he spat. You were there. Caroline looked down at the baby. Her lips started to shake. Did Cathy make a will? asked Helen. Caroline nodded, still staring down at the sucking baby. In June. She knew by then she wasn't going to be around for too long. And Stephen Gare drew it up for her? Yes. She'd met him about a year earlier, when she sold her house. He wasn't based in Oban, but he agreed to act for her. I think they even went out for a while, while she was still well. You know, dinner when he was in town, a couple of weekends away. She didn't tell us much about it because he... Well... He was married, said Helen. Caroline looked up quickly, guiltily, as though she were the one who'd been dating a married man. She nodded. Then what happened? She dropped her head again. The baby had detached itself and was sleeping. Christ, it was like pulling teeth. I wanted to scream at her to get on with it, tell us what she knew. What happened in September 2004? He came to see her, didn't he? She was very ill, in bed all the time. Caroline looked at her husband and there was precious little affection in her face. Mark thought she needed to be in a hospice. He stiffened. It was bad for the kids, seeing their mum like that. They knocked on the door one day, asked to see her. They said they knew she was ill, but it was important. They? asked Helen. Stephen Gare and the other man. He talked like a doctor. What was his name? asked Helen, as my heartbeat went into overdrive. Caroline shook her head. I never knew. What did he look like? I asked. Helen shot me a will-you-let-me-handle-this look. Caroline turned to me. Tall, she said, very tall, big shoulders, fair hair. Apart from that... It's okay, said Helen. We can come back to that. Tell me what happened. I took them up to see her. It was hard for her talking to anyone, but she made a big effort. What did they talk about? They made her an offer. This time Mark was talking. It was between them. We told her she didn't need to do it, that we would take care of the kids. Oh, for God's sake, how could Helen stay so patient? What was the offer? That she would take part in some trials of a new cancer drug. She would have to go away to a hospital on the Shetlands where the trial was taking place. They said there was no guarantee that she'd respond to the drug but that it had been developed for the advanced stages of cancer, and there was always a chance. And in return? In return, the drug company would set up a trust fund for the children, entirely for their benefit. The money is completely controlled. It's released monthly for things like school uniforms for Jamie and childcare for Kirsty. We get none of it. I looked around the room at the immaculate leather sofas, the stereo equipment, the widescreen TV. I remembered the new people carrier in the driveway. And Cathy agreed to this. She didn't have to, insisted Mark. Yes, said Caroline. She agreed. It was the worst thing for her, worrying about the kids, about what would happen to them. They had no one apart from us, and she knew we didn't have a lot of money. She felt it was the only thing she could still do for them. I do understand, said Helen. What happened next? Stephen Gare set up the trust fund, making Mark and me trustees. We signed the papers the next day and the first instalment of money was paid. 
They came for her a couple of days later. Who came? That man, the doctor, in an ambulance, and a nurse. They told her she was going in a helicopter. He said we could visit once she was settled. When did you see her again? Caroline shook her head. We didn't. She died just over a week later. I had to tell Jamie. He thought his mummy was going away to get better. Where was the funeral? Caroline's face took on an angry look. There wasn't one, said Mark. Gair came to see us, said it had been part of the arrangement. Cathy's body would be used for research, donated to medical science, he said. So, you never saw her again? No, she was just gone. Did you talk to her? We didn't even have a number, said Mark. Stephen Gare phoned us most evenings with a report, kept saying she was comfortable but very drowsy with the drugs, not able to talk on the phone. Can you remember the date she died? asked Helen. The 6th of October, said Caroline. Helen was looking at me to see if I'd finally got it. I had. The 6th of October was the day Melissa, Melissa number one, that is, was supposed to have died. We weren't happy, said Mark. We weren't happy at all that she could just disappear like that. We wanted to talk to her doctors, find out about her last days. We kept phoning Stephen Gare, but he wouldn't take our calls. Did you try calling the hospital? I asked. Yes, said Caroline. I rang the Franklin Stone in Lerwick, but they had no record of a Cathy Morton. I panicked a bit then, went down to Stephen Gare's offices in town. He wasn't there, but I made quite a fuss. Then, the next day, that doctor bloke came round, at least the one we thought was a doctor. Go on. Well, I was on my own in the house, and he pretty much threatened me, said we had to stop pestering Mr Gare, Cathy hadn't been harmed by the drugs and would have died anyway, that she was taken very good care of and that we should let it rest now. He implied that if we wanted to keep the money, we'd have to keep quiet. We had to think about the kids, said Mark. Nothing was going to bring Cathy back. We had to think about their future. I wasn't happy, though, repeated Caroline. I threatened to call the police. What did he say? He said he was the police. No one spoke for a few moments. Helen appeared to be thinking hard. Then she turned once more to Caroline. Do you have a photograph of your sister, Mrs Salter? Caroline got up with the baby still clutched to her chest. She crossed the room and opened the top drawer of a dresser. As she fumbled inside, the rest of us looked at the carpet. Then Caroline returned to Helen and gave her something. Helen looked at it for just a second and then handed the photograph to me. It had been taken at a beach on a bright, windy day. Stephen Gare, a couple of years younger and a whole lot happier than when I'd seen him, laughed at the camera. His arms were round a very pretty young woman in a green sweater. They say men often go for the same physical type, and it was certainly true in Gare's case. You'd never have mistaken the two women for twins, but the likeness between Melissa and Cathy was close enough. Similar age and build, long red hair, although Cathy's had been straight, fair skin, fine, small features. There'd been a semblance, after all. Chapter 32 I spent the next ten hours as a guest of the Tayside Constabulary. Helen and I flew to Dundee. She sat up front with the pilot, headphones on, talking continually on the radio. I sat in the back, cocooned by noise. After twenty minutes of watching the scenery, I dug into my bag and pulled out, once more, Dana's copy of The Woman in White. I still hadn't had a chance to look at the post-it markers she'd attached to several of the pages. They were probably just remnants of A-level notes, but as long as we were still in the air, I had little else to do. I opened the book at the first marker. 
Page fifty. Dana had been at work with her pink highlighter again. There stood Miss Fairley, a white figure alone in the moonlight, in her attitude, in the turn of her head, in her complexion, in the shape of her face, the living image of the woman in white. On page three hundred and ninety-one, I found another highlighted piece. The outward changes wrought by the suffering and the terror of the past, fearfully, almost hopelessly, strengthened the fatal resemblances between Anne Catherick and herself. Living image, fatal resemblances. Stephen Gare had had an incredible stroke of luck. Needing to get rid of his wife, he'd known a terminally sick woman who bore a strong resemblance to her. Terrified for the future of her young children, Cathy Morton had allowed herself to be moved to a new hospital where, spaced out with painkillers, she wouldn't have known what was going on around her. And who was there to suspect she wasn't who a respected local solicitor said she was? None of the medical staff who had treated Cathy had known Melissa. Cathy's sister and brother-in-law hadn't been allowed to visit. Melissa's parents hadn't been told she was in hospital, and it was a safe bet. That none of her friends had known either. Even if someone had met Melissa once or twice, it was still possible he or she would have been fooled by the sight of a cancer-ridden Cathy in a hospital bed. Both Cathy and Melissa had been pretty women, but a second photograph Caroline had shown us, of a barely recognisable Cathy towards the end of her illness, showed the devastating effect cancer can have. Cathy had died. Just days after being admitted to hospital, there'd been a post mortem, the report of which I'd seen in Gifford's office, and then she'd been cremated. I imagined the funeral, the church full of Melissa's friends and relatives, deeply shocked by her sudden death, struggling to even begin the process of grief. Which of them could have dreamed the body in the coffin, heading for the furnace, wasn't Melissa at all? That Melissa, still very much alive, was somewhere else. How had he done that? How had Gare arranged for his wife to disappear so effectively? Where had she been for the nine months between Cathy's death and her own? And what the hell had happened to her in that time? I closed the woman in white and put it away. At the time, I knew nothing of the story, but I read it some months later. It's about a man who fakes his wife's death for money, of course, by spiriting her away and substituting a dying woman in her place. Dana had known the story and had been well on her way to working it out. Whether she'd made contact with the Salters, whether that was the final trigger that made her killers act, I'd probably never know. When we landed at Dundee, Helen gave me a quick smile and disappeared into a waiting car. Another car took me to the station, where I was given coffee and left to wait in an interview room. I waited almost an hour, going nearly nuts in the process, and then a member of Helen's team, an inspector, came to interview me. A constable sat in the corner of the room, and the whole thing was tape recorded. I wasn't read my rights. I wasn't offered a lawyer, but in all other respects, it was an interrogation, and he was taking nothing at face value. I told him the whole story, from finding the body to meeting the Salters. I told him about Kirsten Hoyk, who'd been killed in a riding accident, and about my finding the ring that had every appearance of being hers, about someone breaking into my house and my office, about the pig's heart on my kitchen table, about my suspicions that I'd been drugged, and that someone had tampered with my computer. I told him about my sabotaged boat and useless life jacket, about my belief that Dana had been murdered because she'd found out too much. I described the evidence of financial irregularities that Dana had unearthed, and about my escape with Helen through the dark Shetland landscape. Then I went through it all again, and again. He pulled me up time after time, making me repeat myself, clarify myself, until I really wasn't sure what I'd said and what I hadn't. After five minutes, I was very glad I wasn't a suspect in the case. 
After twenty minutes, I was starting to think that perhaps I was. An hour and a half later, we stopped. I was brought lunch. Then he came back. More questions. Another hour, and he leaned back in his chair. Who knew you planned to go sailing that morning, Miss Hamilton? We didn't plan it, I replied, knowing I was stalling. We hadn't even planned spending that weekend on Unst. It was a last-minute thing, but lots of people know we keep a boat there. Do you keep your life jackets there too? I couldn't look at him. No, I said. We keep them at home, in the attic. Duncan would have picked them up from home before we set off. They were locked in the boot of his car till we used them on Sunday morning. He frowned, stared down at his notes for a while, then looked back up at me. Whose idea was it to go sailing? Who thought of it? Duncan's, I said. It was Duncan. I was taken to a cell, given more food, and a note from Helen telling me to eat and rest. When I woke, it was nearly seven in the evening, and Helen was standing in the doorway. She changed into a tailored black trouser suit and an emerald green silk vest. Her hair had been washed and wound up on the top of her head. She looked nothing like the woman I'd ridden across country with the night before. Feeling better, I managed to smile. I guess. Ready to go back. Back. Back to the islands. Early that morning, I'd watched them disappear over the horizon and told myself it was over, that that part of my life was finished with. Now it appeared it was not. Do I have a choice? I asked, knowing what the answer was going to be. Not really. You can eat on the way. On the way to the helipad, she was silent. I had a hundred questions, but I didn't know where to start, and if I'm honest, I was a little afraid to. Helen wasn't my fellow fugitive any more. She was a senior police officer, probably in charge of a very serious investigation, and I was a principal witness. Having got this far, I didn't want to do anything to screw things up. When the driver was parking, she said, "Stephen Gare has confessed." I'd been leaning back in the seat, but at that I sat bolt upright. "You're kidding me! He just admitted it." She nodded. "He's been in custody since midday. It took two hours, and then he cracked." "What?" I mean, what exactly has he confessed to? Stephen Gare had not struck me as the type to give in that easily. Well, everything, selling babies to the highest bidder, for one thing. He says he worked with several of the less scrupulous adoption agencies overseas. Whenever a wealthy couple appeared, they were told about a way of shortcutting the system for a price. It was all done by a sort of blind auction on the internet. When a baby became available, it went to the highest bidder, up to a million dollars in some cases. Our driver got out of the car. He waved to the pilot, who nodded back, and the chopper's blade started to turn. George Reynolds, the director of social services, is in Lerwick Nick, helping us with our inquiries. He's denying all knowledge, but if the babies went overseas with adoption papers, his department must be involved. Who actually took them overseas? A nursing agency. We're talking to them, but so far they claim they didn't know anything was illegal. And Gare admits substituting Cathy for his wife at the hospital. The noise of the helicopter's engines was increasing, and I had to raise my voice. Once we got out of the car, speech would become impossible again. Yep. Insists she was very well treated, that her illness followed its natural course, and that in no way can he be held responsible for her death. He also says no one at the hospital knew anything about it. So, who helped him? Who arranged the ambulance? Claims he did it himself, chartered it privately. The nurse was hired for the occasion. I was thinking as fast as I'd ever done. 
Was it feasible that no one from the hospital was involved? What about the doctor, the one who later claimed to be a policeman, the one who Caroline met? He insists there was no accomplice. Says Caroline was confused. She didn't sound confused to me. No, she is at Lerwick now. We've got an identity parade lined up. So you know who it was. Let's just say we have some ideas. Her face closed up. She was saying no more on that one. I tried another tack. And Melissa. Helen held up one finger at the pilot. Gare admits killing her. She found out about the adoptions and threatened to go to the police. You're not going to like this, but he says he kept her in your cellar. A forensic team's been there for the last few hours. You're kidding me, I whispered, remembering Dana's insistence on looking round my cellar. Her instincts right on the button as usual. He'd handled the probate for the last owner and knew the house was empty. He even had a set of keys. He says he kept Melissa tied up and heavily drugged, and once she'd given birth, he killed her. He claims he acted alone. Bullshit! He couldn't have done that without help. Kept a pregnant woman prisoner for months, delivered a baby. He's covering for someone. Probably. He says he carved the symbols on her back. Got the idea from some markings around your fireplace. Apparently. He wanted to make it look like some sort of cult slaying, to draw attention away from him, if she was ever found. Same with cutting out the heart. He can't remember what he did with the heart. Says he was under a great deal of stress at the time, and that huge chunks of his memory are missing. Bullshit, bull double shit. Thank you, but we worked that out ourselves. He is also admitting that Connor, the little boy he calls his stepson. Is his own child, and Melissa, not Alison, his new wife, was his mother. Dana was right about that too. Beside me, Helen took a sharp breath. Well, we can DNA test, prove it conclusively, one way or another. Look, don't worry. A few more hours, maybe days, and he'll tell us everything. Right now, we need to move. It took us just over an hour to get back. Helen spent the time reading and making notes, her body language giving very definite "don't ask me now" signals, and I didn't want to push her. But shit! First thing that occurred to me, as the helicopter took off, was that we'd never have made it to this point if Stephen Gare hadn't agreed to have his wife's dental records examined. Just days ago, Saturday morning, he'd been cooperation itself. Far from complaining, as he'd have every right to, about my unethical behaviour, he'd allowed the confirmation that the body in my field was that of his wife. Of course, we were still at that stage a long way from working out how the switch had taken place. But even so, Stephen Gare had effectively given himself up that morning. The helicopter banked, and we were heading back over the North Sea to the islands. The sun was low in the sky, spreading its golden warmth over the waves. Why the hell had he done that? Had he been tired of living with the guilt? I'd heard criminals often secretly want to be caught, or had he deliberately played along, knowing the system was in place to protect him, that he had friends who could get him off the hook? Were Dana and I being played that morning? Encouraged to reveal just exactly what we knew before being, well, neutralized, put out of harm's way before we could tell someone who might actually take us seriously. Three days later, Dana was dead, and I'd narrowly escaped drowning. Melissa had found out too much, and she'd been dealt with. She'd suffered a protracted and terrifying death. I wondered what had roused Melissa's suspicions in the first place. What path she'd followed to discover more? At what point she'd become seriously afraid? Whether she tried to escape? First Melissa, then Dana had paid the price for knowing too much, and it wasn't over.
In spite of what Helen had just told me about Gare's confession, I knew it wasn't. Why the hell was I going back to Shetland? We landed in a field close to Lowick Police Station, and the noise dimmed enough for Helen and me to be able to talk. She looked up from her notes. There's a car here waiting to take you home to collect whatever you need. Then we'll put you in a hotel for the night. I'm not sure when we'll need you at the station, so just sit tight. Are you in charge now? No, Detective Superintendent Harris is, but I'm officially advising and observing. We're going by the book from now on, I promise you. She looked round. Several police cars were waiting for us. Then she turned back to me and there was a look on her face I couldn't identify. There is something you need to know. A lot of people are in custody tonight and will stay that way until we're convinced they have nothing to do with all this. I'm afraid your husband is one of them. I nodded. I'd expected that. I even welcomed the news. The last thing I could deal with just then was a confrontation with Duncan. Also, your father-in-law and your boss from the hospital. You may well be needed at work over the next few days. She was right. The hospital couldn't afford to lose me and Gifford. And I thought I was getting away. We climbed down. Helen squeezed my shoulder and stepped into one of the waiting cars. A woman constable introduced herself and led me to a second car. A male constable was driving. We set off on the twenty-minute drive that would take me home. I wondered what I was going to do with my evening, stuck in a strange hotel somewhere in Lowick. The car pulled up at the front of the house. Do you want me to come in with you? asked the WPC. Jane, I think she'd said her name was. No, thank you. I'll be fine. It won't take long. I walked to the front door of the house and found my key. The hall was in darkness, and the house had that still, cold feel that houses assume when they've been empty for a while. I walked down the hall to the kitchen, registering, but not appreciating, the significance of the beam of light shining out from under the door. I pushed the door open. Duncan and Ken Gifford were sitting together at the kitchen table, our bottle of Talisker standing open and nearly empty between them. Chapter 33 I almost yelled, but knew the officers outside would never hear me. I considered making a run for it, but Duncan was too close, and he can move like lightning when he wants to. Ken was staring at me, his eyes so narrow I could barely see beyond the lashes. Duncan moved towards me, the picture of a distraught husband, overwhelmed with relief at seeing his wife again. Tor, thank God! I took a sharp step back and held up both hands in front of me. Duncan looked confused, but he stopped. Are you okay? No, I am not okay. I started to move, edging further round the kitchen, away from the door, but closer to what I'd spotted on the worktop. I am a very long way from being okay. I grabbed out and reached the knife that had been lying on the kitchen counter. It was an all-purpose knife, one I used for just about everything, chopping, slicing, peeling. It was small but sharp. It would serve the purpose. Duncan was looking horrified. Ken vaguely amused. I want you both out of here, right now. If either of you tries to touch me, I will slice you up. Got that? Tor! Duncan moved forward again. Have you got that? I yelled, shoving the knife in his direction. He was still two feet away, but I'd made my point. He stepped back. I've got it, said Gifford, who hadn't moved. He picked up his drink and raised it to his lips. How about you, Dunk? Dunk? Since when were these two on pet name terms? Why don't you get Tora a glass? said Gifford. There are two police officers outside, I said. Well, they can't drink on duty, said Gifford. I swear if the knife had been a gun, I'd have shot him. I think you should both sit down, said Gifford. Tora, if it makes you feel better, invite your two friends outside to come in. I looked from one to the other, 
my tall, handsome husband almost shaking with anxiety, my ugly, compelling boss, the picture of calm. I was told you two were in custody. We were, said Gifford. Interesting experience. Got released about an hour ago. An hour ago, Helen and I were taking off from Dundee. A lot can happen in an hour. Don't tell me, because you and D.I. Dunn go way back. Duncan and Ken glanced at each other. Not exactly, said Gifford, almost to himself. Then he looked at me. Our friends at the station found no charges for us to answer. Can't help but feel you have a few, though. For a second I thought about walking out. Just for a second. You helped Stephen Gare substitute a terminally sick woman for his wife, I said to Gifford. For some reason it was easier to talk to him, accuse him, than speak to Duncan. You helped him keep Melissa Gare prisoner, here in our bloody cellar, for eight months. You kept her alive and delivered her baby, and then you killed her. I stopped and took a deep breath. I cannot begin to imagine what she went through, you inhuman bastard. Gifford flinched. Then his eyes narrowed even more. When Cathy Morton died at our hospital, I was in New Zealand, he said. I told you that already, and I told the police that today. They checked my flight details and people I stayed with in Auckland. So unlike you, they happened to believe me. I never saw Caroline Salter in my life until I took part in an identity parade this afternoon. Had she picked me out, I wouldn't be here now. I wasn't having it. Somebody helped Gare. He couldn't have done it alone. No, I don't think he could, but he wasn't helped by us. Neither of us had anything to do with what's been going on up on Tronal. We had no reason to want Melissa Gare dead. Gifford had lowered his voice almost to a whisper. I found myself staring into his eyes, wanting to believe him. I made myself look away. You wanted me dead, though, I said to Duncan. The idiot at the boatyard got it wrong, Tor. Duncan was still hovering, wanting to come towards me, not quite daring to. I, I know what you think, but it's bollocks. The mast collapsed while we were out, but it didn't break clean off. After I was picked up, the boat got caught around some salmon cages. The salvage team had to saw through the rest of the mast to get it clean away. McGill's boy didn't know that. He just jumped to conclusions. I thought about it. It wasn't impossible. A mast doesn't always break clean away. Sometimes it just buckles under the force of the wind. Still attached to the boat, it flies around in every direction. It's a messy and highly dangerous situation, and most sailors carry bolt croppers in case it happens to them. No one's trying to kill you, said Duncan, in what was almost a whisper. Although House Officer Donaldson is pretty pissed off that you yelled at him the other day, said Gifford, he's considering an official complaint. Will you fucking well pack it in? Half the islands were out looking for me last night. You had a chopper searching the moors, for God's sake. You don't do that unless you want someone pretty badly. We were worried about you. You bailed out of the hospital with a whole load of diazepam in your system. For all we knew, you'd convinced yourself you could fly and were heading for the nearest cliff top to boogie with the puffins. Someone killed Dana. She found out too much about Stephen Gare, about all of you. Dana's post-mortem was carried out today. Do you want to know what they found? Suddenly I wanted to sit down after all. I even caught myself looking at the talisker. Gifford pushed his glass over towards me. Duncan glared at him. I saw that behind them the door to the cellar was sealed off with red and white police tape. I made myself look away. I didn't want to start thinking about what might have happened down there. I nodded to Gifford to start talking. Death occurred due to extensive blood loss when the radial and ulnar arteries were severed on both wrists. The angle of the wounds and the weakness of the cut on the right wrist 
suggest the wounds were self-administered. There was no trace of drugs in her bloodstream and no bruises to indicate she was held down. The conclusion is death by suicide. I shook my head. You can read the report yourself. Dana did not commit suicide. I wasn't sure any more about Gifford's involvement. I could no longer swear that Duncan had tried to kill me, but if I had just one thing, one truth to hold on to, it was that Dana did not kill herself. If I had been wrong about Dana, I could have been wrong about everything. And I wasn't. I bloody well wasn't. And then Gifford took my breath away. Probably not. But listen now. You may never be able to prove otherwise. His pupils were enormous, and the irises of his eyes had no colour. I had to blink hard and shake myself to look away. I turned to Duncan. He'd resumed his seat, and he reached out across the table towards me. I looked at his tanned, calloused hand and shook my head, putting my own hands firmly together in front of me. Gifford glanced at Duncan, who nodded his head forward just once. Then Gifford spoke. Caroline Salter identified Andrew Dunn as the man who'd accompanied Gare when he visited Cathy. Dunn was involved in the adoption scam, has made thousands from it over the years. He almost certainly conspired with Gare to kill Melissa, and he may well have killed Dana Tullach, too. But... Tora, in all likelihood, you'll never be able to prove it. I leaned back in my chair, hands pressed to my mouth because I knew that any second now I was going to start sobbing. I didn't doubt what he was saying for a second. I picked up Gifford's glass and drained it. The scotch hit the back of my throat like a blow, but it helped. I wasn't going to cry just yet. How? How did he... Gifford poured another drink. Same glass. D.I. Dunn leaves a lot to be desired as a police officer, but he does have... How shall I put it? A few unusual skills. And something clicked into place. He hypnotized her. He made her slash her own wrists. Gifford nodded. Probably, he said. I looked at Duncan. He gave me a sympathetic twitch of the lips. I turned back to Gifford. You can do it too. He waited for a second before inclining his head forward in acknowledgement. Oh, Jesus! I stood up, panic building. I looked round for my knife, but it was by Duncan's elbow. When the hell had he done that? I looked at the door. Tora, it's a party trick. Gifford was out of his seat. How do you think Duncan got you to marry him? I looked horrified at Duncan, praying he was going to look outraged and deny it. He just stared back at me. You think uphill yar lasts all winter? Continued Gifford, resuming his seat. We make our own fun up here. Take it easy, Ken. It's not funny, said Duncan. No, you're right. I'm sorry. Gifford reached out and took hold of my hand. It didn't occur to me to stop him, but Duncan loudly cleared his throat and Ken let go. I sat down again. So what are you telling me? You can all do it up here? It's on the high school curriculum? Of course not, said Duncan. Just a couple of the older families. It's a sort of passed down through the generations thing. Bit of a game, really. Although it can give us an edge in business meetings, you know, get people on side more quickly. All harmless. Andy was always better at it than most. I think he enjoyed the sense of power it gave him, said Gifford. You'll tell them. You'll tell the police about this. Duncan and Gifford looked at each other again, and I really wished they'd stop doing it. I could not get used to these two as co-conspirators. If you want us to, said Gifford. But against considerable evidence of suicide, how seriously do you think people are going to take us? At that moment, we all jumped as a sudden noise rang out through the quiet of the house. Someone was banging on the front door, and at the same time, the telephone started ringing. We looked at each other, not really sure what to do, what to respond to first. 
Then I got up and left the room. Behind me, I could hear Duncan answering the phone. I walked quickly to the front door and opened it. The WPC was on the doorstep, her colleague immediately behind her. Are you all right? She was trying to see over my shoulder. We've been told to check on you, not leave you alone. I nodded. I'm fine. Come on in. I led the officers to our living room. Can you wait here for a bit? There's something I need to finish. As I returned to the kitchen, Duncan was holding out the phone. I took it. Tora, I've only just been told. Helen was speaking fast. About your husband being released. Are you okay? I'm fine. Really, don't worry. Are the constables with you? In the next room. Well, for God's sake, keep them there. I'm really not happy about this, but I can't get away right now. Gare has admitted that Andy Dunn was working with him and helped him kill Melissa. Duncan and Ken were both watching me. Andy Dunn killed Dana, I said. The line was silent for a few seconds. I can't deal with that right now. I'll get back to you. She hung up, and I replaced the receiver. I closed the kitchen door so the two officers in the living room couldn't hear us, and sat down again. Dunn hasn't been seen since about 11 p.m. last night, said Gifford. The Salter woman had to identify his photograph. They think he's left the islands. Until he's found, you need to be careful. Duncan made an exasperated noise. He picked up the bottle, emptied it into his glass, and sat glowering at the amber-coloured liquid. Take it easy, Duncan, said Ken, with something like a warning in his voice. There were emotions in the room that were threatening to sizzle out of control. It was no longer just me venting my righteous anger on these two. There was more at stake, and I couldn't figure it out. Then I remembered something. You two are receiving money from Tronal, I said, turning to Duncan. The place even paid for this goddamn house. If neither of you are involved with the maternity clinic, why are you on its payroll? Looks like we've no secrets left, buddy, said Ken, looking round the room. Will you tell her or shall I? By the way, I'm starving. Is anyone planning on eating tonight? As Ken got up and crossed the room, I waited for Duncan to tell me the last big secret. Eight people get a monthly income from Tronal, he said eventually. In addition to the staff, of course. Ken and I, Dad... Gare and Dunn, and three others you probably don't know. Why? I demanded, leaning back in my chair. Ken had moved out of my line of sight, and I didn't like it. We own it. We bought shares around ten years ago. It was in financial trouble about to go under, and we bailed it out. It was long before I met you, and I never thought to mention it. My trust fund was part of the loan. It was paid back in December in time to buy the house. They owned the clinic, and knew nothing about what had been going on up there. Was I seriously expected to believe this? The Tronal Clinic has been around for a long time, continued Duncan. This business with Gare, it's just like the rotten branch of a tree. Tronal has helped a lot of women in its time, a lot of local families. Gifford had opened our fridge door. Finding nothing in there, he turned back. Most babies born there are adopted, normally and legally, he said. Most people who work at the clinic probably knew nothing about what Gare and Dunn were up to. I'm pretty certain Richard didn't. He opened a cupboard, closed it again. I still don't understand why you bailed it out. Why did you care? Ken opened another cupboard. Christ, have you two even heard of supermarkets? He gave up and came back to the table. Because we were born there, said Duncan. He waited a while, giving me time to take it in. We were both tronal babies, adopted by island families. So was done. I'm not sure about the others. I stared at Duncan. Elspeth and Richard aren't your parents? Elspeth couldn't have children, said Duncan. A shadow crossed his face. Richard could, he added, looking at Ken. 
Richard is my father, said Ken. I found I had nothing to say. Richard and Elspeth tried for several years to have a family, explained Ken. During that time when I guessed their relationship was under some strain, Richard had an affair with a house officer at the hospital. She had her baby in the maternity unit on Tronal and put me up for adoption by the Giffords. Three years later, Elspeth finally admitted defeat and agreed to adopt, too. Duncan was four months old and, I'm led to believe, a very appealing infant. You two are brothers, I asked, looking from one to the other. Gifford shrugged. Well, not biologically, but yes, I've always felt we're family. Duncan's face darkened. Why didn't they adopt you? I asked Ken. Elspeth doesn't know about me. I didn't know who my genetic father was myself till I was sixteen. I wasn't surprised, though. No, I bet he hadn't been. I couldn't imagine why I hadn't thought of it before. I'd seen the strong likeness between Richard and Ken, the antipathy between Duncan and Ken, the cool formality that was Duncan's relationship with his parents, but I hadn't put all the pieces together. Ken, the doctor, the blood son, the spiritual son. Duncan, the poor foundling, taken in to keep Elspeth happy. Poor Duncan. Poor Ken, come to think of it. What a mess. An hour later, I was still at home. I'd found I really couldn't cope with a night in a strange hotel. WPC Jane, at Helen's insistence, was sleeping in one of our spare rooms. Duncan was firmly consigned to another. It wasn't that I didn't believe everything he told me. Actually, I did. I wanted to talk to Helen about it, get it all checked out. But the more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that the lies were over, that I finally had most of the answers. I took a long shower, shampooed my hair twice, and then cleaned my teeth. It felt good to be back in a bathroom. In spite of my nap in the Dundee police cell, I could feel my eyelids drooping. Then I caught sight of Duncan's toilet bag on the bathroom shelf and was suddenly wide awake again. No, I didn't have all the answers yet after all. I walked across the corridor and pushed open the door of the spare room. Duncan was lying on the bed, headphones on, face downcast. He pulled them off, brightening at the sight of me, until he saw the look on my face. I held up the packet I'd extracted from his wash bag. Anything you want to say? He took off his headphones, stood up. How about, I'm sorry? I shook my head. Not nearly good enough. I stepped into the room, wondering how much damage I could inflict on him before either A, he overpowered me, or B, we were interrupted by Constable Jane. Do you have any idea what it's been like for me this past year? Duncan, to his credit, could no longer look me in the eye. I have to see, talk to, touch pregnant women every working day of my life. I have to listen to the moaning about nausea, tiredness, backache, groin strain, until I have to sit on my hands to stop myself from slapping them, from yelling at them to stop moaning, you silly bitch, be grateful for what you have. I have to touch every newborn baby, feel its solid little body between my hands, and each time I'm torn between wanting to run away with it or hurl it out of the goddamned window. Every time I hand one over to its mother, I feel like my heart has been ripped in two. I want to collapse onto the delivery room floor and sob. Why? Why? Why isn't it me? Why is it that every other bloody woman in the world can do this and I can't? By the time I finished, I was yelling, and I thought I could hear movement along the corridor. Duncan still couldn't look at me, but what I saw on his face looked like fear. I think I surprised even alarmed myself. Months of misery, of bewilderment at being unable to conceive, crystallized for me that evening, and for the first time I put everything into words. Duncan had turned away from me and was leaning on the edge of the window. I followed him round the bed and forced myself to lower my voice. 
It no longer sounded like my voice, though. It sounded evil. Except I can, can't I? I can have babies. All this pain has been totally unnecessary. You didn't need to saw through the mast, Duncan. You've been killing me for over a year. I threw the packet at him. It seemed ridiculously inadequate, and I looked round the room for a bigger missile. Fortunately for both of us, there was nothing to hand. The bedside lamp was pretty sturdy, but when I realised I'd have to unplug it first, the urge left me. I walked to the door, then turned back. That shit isn't even licensed in the UK. Who got them for you? Daddy or Big Brother? You know what? I don't give a toss any more. And by the way, I know you're planning to leave me, and thank bloody Christ for that. I walked out, slamming the door behind me, and caught sight of Jane at the top of the stairs. I went back into my room and closed the door. Well, sleep didn't seem like a possibility any more. I wondered how I was going to get through the rest of the night. I discovered I was hungry, but as Ken had learned earlier, the cupboards were bare. The bedroom door opened. I don't want to hear it, I said, realising I'd feel pretty daft if I turned round and found Constable Jane in the doorway. There's a reason my birth mother put me up for adoption, said Duncan. You're confusing me with someone who gives a damn, I replied, still not turning round. She had multiple sclerosis, continued Duncan. She was already ill when she had me. She knew she would deteriorate quickly. I said nothing, but my posture must have betrayed that I was listening. I know I carry the gene, said Duncan. There's a good chance I'll get ill myself, although I'm already older than she was when she died. There's a fifty percent risk I'll pass the gene on to any children. I turned. The skin around Duncan's eyes had turned red and blotchy. His eyes were shining. I'd never seen him cry before. How little we really know the people around us. He risked coming further into the room. I know I should have told you. I'm really sorry I didn't. Why? Why didn't you tell me? When did you find out? I've known since I was a child. I have no excuse, except that when I met you, you showed no interest in having a family. When you weren't working, you were riding, risking your neck on cross-country courses every weekend. You were going to be a consultant by the time you were thirty-five, and win the badminton horse trials. I couldn't see how children could fit into that lifestyle. What he was saying was true, but he was describing the person I'd been eight years ago. I changed. The lifestyle changed. I know that. But when was I supposed to tell you? When we were engaged? Yes, I interrupted. That would have been appropriate. I was terrified you'd change your mind. And you never said, by the way, Dunk, I want six kids in the first six years. We talked about this ad nauseum. You said you wanted kids too. I do. They just can't be mine. I should have known this. I came off the pill. I had all those tests. We shagged ourselves silly. And all that time, I knew that if we moved up here, we could adopt. A newborn, maybe more than one. Those tests, your sperm tests, they were all normal. How did you do it? Oh, Christ, is it really important? Yes, it's important. How? It was just a matter of timing. Desogestral wears off pretty quickly if you stop taking it. When I knew I had a sperm count, I just avoided going near you when you were ovulating. He moved closer, sat down on the bed next to me. Women can love adopted babies. The maternal bond doesn't rely upon a blood link. Neither does the paternal one. Oh, because you and your folks are just so close. He shook his head. Not a good example. I know a lot of adoptees. They're adored, precious children. They bring huge happiness. You still don't get it, do you? It wasn't just any baby. It was your baby. 
a little boy with dark blue eyes and long limbs and hair that will never lie flat, no matter how much I comb it. I used to talk to that baby, tell him stories about his parents, his cousins, what we would all do together when he was born. He even had a name. There was a lot more I needed to say, but it just wasn't possible. What was his name? It doesn't matter. It matters. What was his name? Dunkaroonie, I managed. For a moment I thought Duncan was laughing. Then I realised he wasn't. We sat together side by side as the night got darker. Chapter 34 the next day, I went to work. Before leaving the night before, Ken had asked me to come in if I felt up to it, my suspension having expired with the knowledge that the hospital was in the clear. I was still smarting from the indignity of it all, but when it came down to it, I didn't have anything I'd rather do that morning. Sometime in the night, Duncan and I had declared a truce. There remained a lot of unfinished business, but neither of us had the energy to resume hostilities just yet. We were having some time out. As to the future, I wasn't sure. Duncan had told me that the fight I'd overheard on Unst had been about his desire to leave Shetland, that Elspeth had been referring to me when she'd said he was in love. He declared that no power on earth would make him leave me. The jury was still out, though, on whether I was staying. With him, in the job, on the islands, I didn't know. I was taking it one day at a time, because in spite of all the lies, in spite of everything he'd kept from me, I still loved him. I did the ward round, ignoring the curious looks I was getting from the staff. When I'd been forced to admit, but only to myself, that the unit had been functioning perfectly well without me, I went upstairs to prepare for afternoon clinic. I phoned my friend in Vaux and learned that Charles and Henry were fine. I thanked her for taking care of them and fielded her few curious questions as to how and why they were there. I made arrangements to collect them that evening. I wondered about what was happening at home. As Duncan and I were leaving that morning, the police had arrived in force. As Helen had promised, they were carrying out another sweep of our fields, but I no longer believed they'd find anything. Maybe one day I'd have another look at the island's female mortality statistics, get someone else's opinion. One day at a time. But there was one thing I really had to do that day. I picked up the phone, dialed a London number, and asked to be put through to a woman I'd worked with at my last hospital, the consultant anaesthetist. Diane, I said, when we were finally connected. It's Torah. My goodness, stranger, how are you? Well, there was no truthful short answer to that, so I gave the usual lie. Fine. You? Great. Will we see you in September? Of course, we're looking forward to it, I said, having not thought about it in weeks. A wedding in a picture book, Buckinghamshire Village. I'd forgotten that normal life was still going on somewhere out there. Look, I'm sorry about this, but... I need some information, and I don't have much time. Is that okay? Fire away. What do you know about untraceable drugs? Diane wasn't easily phased. She paused only a second before replying. Well, ultimately there aren't any. If you know what to look for, you can find anything. Thought so. But if you were trying to knock someone out, not necessarily kill them, just incapacitate them just for a short while. Is there anything you could use that a pathologist wouldn't normally test for? Has Duncan been playing you up again? There was an edge to her voice now, but I could hardly blame her. It wasn't exactly a run-of-the-mill question. I'm sorry. I, I wish I had time to explain. I I'll call you soon, I promise. Can you think of anything, something unusual, that they wouldn't test for unless they were specifically asked? Well, I'd need to check, but I'm pretty certain they don't routinely check for things like benzodiazepines, you know, 
nitrazepam or temazepam? Does that help? Yes, it does. I promise I'm not planning anything illegal. I believe you. Oh, by the way, I got the dress. She named a hideously expensive London bridal designer and wittered away happily for a few more minutes. I was happy to let her, but I wasn't really listening. Dunn might be a dab hand with the old hypnosis, but it still didn't seem likely that someone as sensible and smart as Dana could be hypnotised into killing herself. Hypnotised for long enough to allow herself to be drugged, maybe. Once unconscious, it would be a relatively simple matter to carry her to the bath and cut through both wrists, probably using her own hands to do it. If Stephen Rennie hadn't found anything in Dana's system, it was because he hadn't known what to look for. I wasn't going to accept what Gifford had said last night. Dana was not going to her grave a suicide. Not if I had anything to do with it. Hey! I looked up. Hey, yourself! Helen stood in the doorway. She was wearing the same suit as last night, but had changed her blouse for a ruby red one. She still looked great. I wondered if Dana had taken her shopping, supervised her wardrobe, or maybe it had been the other way round. Maybe Dana owed her sense of style to this lady. I'd probably never know. I felt a pang of regret that I'd never be able to know them as a couple. She came in. I realised I was ridiculously pleased to see her. Coffee, I offered. She nodded and I got up to pour it out. We sat together for a while. Are you OK? she asked, and from the way she was looking at me just a little too intently, I started to think that she might have something to tell me. I'm fine, I said, stalling for time because I wasn't sure I wanted to hear whatever it was. Better than fine, actually. Duncan and I sorted a few things out and here I am, back at work. Things that seemed impossible just twenty-four hours ago. I nodded. Is Duncan... I mean... Is he in the clear? I think so. His story about being a shareholder checks out, and he doesn't seem to have set foot on Tronal for years. The Franklin Stone and Mr. Gifford seem out of it as well. You heard about Dunn, I take it? I did. Is that bad? Bad as it gets. When a copper's your villain, there's no happy ending. Is he still missing? She finished her coffee and got up to pour a refill. Yep. He was seen catching a ferry to the mainland on Tuesday evening. We've alerted all the air and ferry ports, but could be well away by now. She nodded. Right. The good news is your fields have been thoroughly swept this morning. You won't be uncovering any more nasty surprises should you decide to plant a few spring bulbs. And it was all properly done. The instruments were switched on and everything. Well, I had to ask. Helen didn't take offence. She almost laughed. OK. Let me tell you what they did, as far as I understand it. First of all, they flew over in the chopper this morning and took a whole load of aerial photographs. Apparently, and I admit I didn't know this, when soil has been disturbed at any depth, it shows up on the surface, either as marks on the soil or as crop marks. Also, you might get an increase in vegetation, a rush of spring flowers, for example. Aerial photographs can pick that up. Did they see anything? Nothing. But apparently they didn't really expect to. The method works best for larger sites such as prehistoric burial grounds. Individual graves rarely show up. But it has been known, so they were being thorough to check. So, what then? The next step was to use ground-penetrating radar. They have instruments that send electromagnetic pulses into the ground. When the pulses hit a soil surface that differs in water content from that around it, the signals bounce back. The team plot all these signals on a graph, and if anything has been buried, the pattern of reflections will show it up on the graph. It's even possible to estimate how deep a burial might be based on the time delay for the reflections to come back. We've done that across the length and breadth of the field. Clever stuff? Oh, it's amazing. Of course, it's not foolproof, 
It works best, apparently, on sandy, high-resistivity soil, of which there's very little in your field. So they did one further sweep, this time using soil analysis. Want me to go on? Please. Soil analysis depends upon measuring the amount of phosphate in the soil. Phosphate is present in all soils, but where a body, human or large animal, is buried, the phosphate levels increase quite considerably. That certainly made sense to me. Bodies are particularly rich in phosphorus, which, along with calcium, gives bone its strength and hardness. It's also found in other tissues of the body. Decomposition of human bodies after burial enriches the phosphorus content of the surrounding soil. Continued Helen. The team took hundreds of soil samples from your field. If any strong pockets of phosphorus are found, that could indicate more burials. How long will it take to test them all? A few more days, but they're already well under way, and nothing has been found so far. I really don't think there's anything down there, Tora. I said nothing for a moment. So, no more worries about little grey men with a silver fixation," said Helen. I had the grace to look bashful. Guess the stress was getting to me the other night. She smiled back. I looked at her carefully. The slightly wary, nervous look was still there. There's something else, isn't there? Something not so good. I'm afraid so. It looks like Stephen Gare isn't going to be facing justice after all. Not in this life, anyway. Helen broke eye contact first. She stood up and walked to the window. What happened? I managed, wondering why I was feeling so cold. It wasn't as if he'd got away or anything. He hanged himself. She replied, still enjoying my view of the staff car park. He was found shortly after five this morning. She gave me time to think about it. I thought about it. I would never have the chance to face him in court to say, "I know what you did," and have people believe me. I would never be able to look him in the eyes and say, "Got you, you bastard! I bloody well got you." How did I feel about that? Pretty damned pissed off, to be frank. I stood up. How could that have happened? What did you do? Give him some rope to practice tying knots with? At last, she turned round. She held up her hand. Take it easy. It will be fully investigated. I can't give you details. I'm afraid. These things happen. I know they shouldn't, but they do. He just wasn't considered a suicide risk. Unlike Dana, of course, who you dismissed as a suicide without a shred of evidence. As soon as I said it, I knew I'd gone too far. Helen's face had hardened. She started to move. I stepped in front of her. I'm sorry, that was totally uncalled for. She relaxed a little. I guess it's really over then, I said. You're kidding, aren't you? This tronal business will keep us going for years. I found myself wanting to sit down again. What do you mean? That place is an unholy hotchpotch of medical work, social services, legitimate business, and the illegal trading of infants. A few dozen people are connected with it. They all need to be checked out. And of course, we obviously have to trace all the babies that have been adopted from Tronal. All that could take a while. Quite. Trouble is, we can see the money coming in. But they're all cash transfers that will be hellishly hard to trace to source. We may suspect which adoption agencies were involved, but without proof, they're hardly going to admit it. What about at this end? There would be birth records, adoption papers, passports prepared. Maybe, but we can't find them yet. Well, apart from the half dozen or so a year that get adopted locally, but they seem to be completely in order. Everyone we've spoken to so far, including George Reynolds at Social Services and his team, are denying any knowledge of overseas adoptions, whether for money or not. Well, they would, wouldn't they?
Yes, but the fact is, there's no evidence of any significant number of babies being born there, less than a dozen a year by all accounts. On the surface, it seems a pretty low-key operation, which, when you come to think of it, you'd expect. How many babies are put up for adoption these days? She had a point. But he admitted it. He said he was selling babies over the internet. True, but apart from the money and the word of a now-dead man, we really have no evidence. She walked over to the coffee table, put her mug down. I'm on my way up there now. Long trip, said a voice from the doorway. We both turned. Ken Gifford stood there. Neither of us had heard him approach. No helicopter pad on Trono, he explained. You need to go by road and boat. I'll call you later, Tora, said Helen. She nodded at Gifford and left the room. DCI Rowley, he asked me. I nodded. Every bit as gorgeous as they say. I felt the need for something to do. I picked up Helen's mug and my own and took them over to the sink. Take it from me, you're wasting your time. He laughed. I'd heard. How are you doing? He came closer and looked carefully at me. It's so bloody unfair, this ability big men have to intimidate others. They don't have to be smart, they don't have to threaten. They just have to be there. I sidestepped round him and walked over to the window. Fine, I answered for what felt like the tenth time that morning. Good to have you back. He glanced at the coffee pot, noticed it was empty, and helped himself to a digestive biscuit. Says the man who suspended me in the first place. Says the woman who's never going to let me forget it. He moved towards me again, and I retreated behind the desk. He made an exasperated face. Well, you keep still. I'm not about to hypnotize you. I never really managed it anyway. You're a particularly tricky subject. And yes, as I was meant to, I felt a surge of pride at that. I also felt a bit daft. I decided to risk looking him in the eyes. Green, they were. A deep, mossy green this morning. But if he put his hands on my shoulders, I was yelling. I didn't get a chance to congratulate you last night, he said. I searched his face for sarcasm, but didn't see any. I'd be tempted to say you picked the wrong profession, but I really don't want to lose you from this one. You're only saying that because the hospital has come up smelling of lavender. If there were any dirt still clinging to you and yours, you'd be patting me on the head, making worried noises and murmuring about sedatives. He fixed me with a stare. Richard is still in custody. Shit. I'd walked right into that one. Would I ever learn to engage my brain before my mouth opened? Sorry. I, I should have thought of that. And then that big warm hand was on my upper arm, and I wasn't making a sound. You've dealt with more this past week than most do in a lifetime. Richard can look after himself. He turned to leave, and there was a cold space on my arm. Ken, he turned in the doorway. I'm sorry. He raised one eyebrow. About suspecting you, I added. Accepted. And I'm still thinking about it. About what? About what I'm going to do with you. He grinned at me and left the room. I sat down. Shit, I said out loud, and there I'd been thinking all my problems were solving themselves. I went downstairs. A couple of my third trimester ladies were kind enough to say they'd missed me at the last clinic. But the tronal business was still preying on my mind, so as soon as we broke for lunch, I grabbed a sandwich and went back up to my room. From my bag, I dug out the pieces of paper that had started it all. The record of deliveries for the Shetland District Health Authority. Let it go, Tora, said a voice in the back of my head. The faint, slightly wistful voice that speaks for the sensible, grown-up part of me. 
Unfortunately, I'd never really learned to pay attention to that voice, and I wasn't about to start now. Once again, I counted up the tronal deliveries. Four. Four in a six-month period meant around six to ten a year. If around half a dozen were adopted locally, that just didn't leave enough to sell overseas and make any sort of money. Where the hell had Stephen Gare been getting his babies from? And how on earth could the sort of state-of-the-art maternity facility that had been described to me be feasible for just eight births per annum? The equipment and the staff would be standing around doing nothing for most of the year. There must be more babies being born at Tronal than were recorded on my stats. But how could a birth not be registered? Dana had also mentioned terminations, but that made little sense. Terminations are available everywhere in the UK. Why on earth would significant numbers of women travel all the way to Tronal for what they could get in their hometown? If only I could go with Helen to Tronal. I'd know the questions to ask, be able to spot anything that didn't fit far better than she could. But it was impossible. If any sort of trial came out of all this, I would be a key witness. I couldn't keep interfering in the official investigation. I started going through the list one more time. The first thing that jumped out at me were those blessed initials. KT. Keloid trauma. Problems arising from previous perineum scarring. I flicked to another screen and typed keloid trauma into the Google search engine. Nothing. But the term had been coined to describe a condition particular to Shetland, so maybe it hadn't yet made it onto the World Wide Web. I went into the hospital archives and ran a similar search. Nothing. I started checking all the KT entries again. First of April, a baby boy born on Papastour. Then on 8th May, another boy born here at the Franklin Stone. On 19th May, a third boy. Of course, they were all boys. But the sex of the baby couldn't possibly have an impact upon perineum scarring, could it? On 6th June, Alice and Jenna had had a little boy on Bresse. Later in June, another delivery at the Franklin Stone. Hang on a minute. That name meant something. Alison Jenna. Where had I heard that before? Jenna. 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 Shit, it had gone. Stephen Rennie was in his windowless office, eating a sandwich and drinking Fanta from a can. He sensed me standing in his doorway, looked up, and then started making those slightly embarrassed, fidgety movements we all make when we've been caught eating alone. As though eating were some sort of not quite respectable indulgence instead of the most natural thing in the world. Sorry, I said, giving the time-honoured response and looking slightly embarrassed myself, as though I'd caught him on the loo. Not at all, he responded, ridiculously forgiving me. He stood up, motioned to a chair. I took it. I wanted to ask you something. About Dana Tullach. His forearms were on the desk and he leaned forward. I could smell tuna fish on his breath. Mr Gifford said you'd found no traces of any sort of drug in her system and... Miss Hamilton. He leaned forward some more and I tried not to back away. It smelled as though he'd been eating cat food. I know you can't discuss specifics with me, and I really don't want to put you in a difficult position, but... Miss Hamilton, please, just give me a second. I've been speaking to an anaesthetist friend of mine this morning. She mentioned some drugs that would incapacitate someone, but that wouldn't normally be tested for in a post-mortem. I just wondered if you... Miss Hamilton! Stephen Rennie had raised his voice. I didn't carry out Miss Tullock's post-mortem. Oh, I said. Had Gifford mentioned Stephen Rennie, or had I just assumed? I'll get a copy of the report, of course, but I don't think it's come through just yet. I can check for you. 
So who did? I demanded, manners out the window. He frowned at me. I never actually saw Miss Tullock. She was only here for a couple of hours and I was in meetings. She was taken to Dundee. I understand her next of kin, a policewoman, requested the transfer. The PM was carried out in Dundee. Of course. I'm sorry. Helen hadn't mentioned it, but there was no real reason why she should. It certainly made sense that she'd want Dana's post-mortem to be carried out by people she knew and trusted. Is there anything else I can help you with? Well, I know a dismissal when I hear one. I shook my head, thanked him again, and left. Back in my office there was an email from Gifford asking for my help in theatre that afternoon. He had a full list himself, and a patient with a ruptured appendix had been admitted that morning. It would save him rearranging his list if I could do it. I am not qualified for general surgery, but the appendix was well within my region of expertise. I checked my messages, one from Duncan, the rest all non-urgent, and went down to theatre. The patient was a thirty-year-old male, fit and healthy. I opened him up, fumbled around for a few minutes, and removed the offending piece. Swollen like a drum, no wonder he was in pain. Just as I finished closing, and the patient was being wheeled out to recovery, Gifford came in. He was still gowned up and his gloves were covered in blood. I glanced down. So were mine. The other staff had left theatre and we were alone. He unhooked his mask from one ear. Will you have dinner with me? I left my mask in place. When? He shrugged. Tonight? I managed to look him straight in the eye. How kind! I'll see if Duncan's free. He reached out and took the mask from my face. As he did so, his gloved fingers brushed my cheek and I couldn't help the shudder. He saw it, of course. I'll ask again. I wondered if I had blood on my face. I'll email you the hospital's policy on sexual harassment. He laughed. Don't bother. I wrote it. He stood still for a moment, looking at me, and from beneath the harsh, antiseptic smells of theatre came a scent so warm and familiar it made me want to step closer, breathe it in, catch hold of his clothes, and press them to my face. Then he turned and left, and the scent was gone. I found I was shaking. The scrub nurse came back into the room and started collecting up instruments. I thanked her and left, praying I wouldn't bump into Gifford on the way back to my room. I spent an hour on the wards, then decided to check on my appendix patient. He was awake, but drowsy. His wife sat by his side. His young son, about fifteen months old, perched on the edge of the bed. His mother held him with one hand, his father with the other, and he bounced gleefully. It can't have been comfortable, but if my patient wasn't objecting, neither was I. I checked him out, aware that something at the back of my mind was nagging me, and agreed he could go home the next day if he got plenty of rest. I stopped by the canteen, bought a chocolate muffin, and carried it back to my room. I made fresh coffee, sat down at my desk, and remembered. The family group, the appendix patient, his wife and baby son. I knew who Alison Jenner was. She was Stephen Gare's second wife, the woman who was stepmum to his son by Melissa. So why the hell was her name on the list of Shetland births? She hadn't given birth, Melissa had. Stephen Gare had admitted that his son, Connor, was Melissa's child. How could Alison's name be included on a list of women who had delivered that summer? And why did her entry include the KT reference? I found the list and checked, just in case I'd been mistaken. There she was. Alison Jenner, aged 40, gave birth to a little boy, eight pounds two ounces, on 6th June. Surely that couldn't be coincidence. It had to be the same woman. OK, think. The Gares only had one child. So... 
Either Stephen Gare had been lying about Connor being Melissa's, and why the hell would he? Or the entry must be referring to Melissa's son. I double-checked the number of entries with the KT initials after them. There were seven that summer. I pulled up the corresponding list for the subsequent period from September 2005 through February 2006. Couldn't see anything. Then I went back to the previous winter. Nothing. I went back again to the summer of 2004. No KT entries. I kept on going back until I spotted them again. In summer 2002, there were five entries with KT after them, born in various centres around the islands, all baby boys. A tightness was forming in my chest as I went further back, examining whole years at a time. 2001 was clear, so was 2000. In the summer of 1999, there were six KT entries. Boys. I wanted to switch off the computer, get into my car and drive home, collect the horses and ride for miles along the beach. Better still, run up to Ken Gifford's office, lock the door and take off every stitch I was wearing, anything to take my mind off what was now staring me in the face. I stayed where I was and I brought up more screens. I went back to 1980 and that was enough. The pattern was unmistakable. Every three years, between four and eight baby boys had their deliveries recorded as KT. Every three years, the female death rate on Shetland made a modest but unmistakable blip. The following summer, some unusual little boys were born. KT. It had nothing to do with keloid trauma. That was a smokescreen. The condition probably didn't even exist. KT stood for Kunal Trau. I flicked back faster and faster to the earliest year the computerised records showed. They began in 1975. I needed to go further back. I stood up on legs that felt none too steady and walked as fast as I dared along the corridor to the service lift. It arrived within two minutes and by some miracle was empty. I pressed B for basement and went down. The floor seemed empty. I followed the signs and walked down a corridor lit by occasional electric bulbs. Several had blown. As I walked, I looked out for switches on the walls. I did not want to find myself trapped in pitch blackness down here, scrambling around for switches that didn't exist. I reached the end of the corridor. Most hospital archives are a mess, and these were no exception. They were housed in three basement rooms. I pushed the door of the first. Darkness. I felt around on the wall for a light switch. The room sprang into a grimy light. I could feel the dust in my throat. Everything was in large brown cardboard boxes, stacked several high on steel shelving. The labels were mostly turned to the front. I walked along the shelves, keeping one eye firmly on the open door. I doubted these rooms were visited more than a couple of times a year. If a door slammed shut, locked from the outside, Tora could say hi to a pleasant few days of starvation and terror. I didn't find obstetrics and opened the door to the second room. Same layout as the first. This time I wedged the door open. In the third row I found them. It took a few minutes to locate the box I needed and pull it down. Inside were ledgers, handwritten records of births, the manual equivalent of the lists I'd been looking at on my computer. I found the year I was looking for, 1972, and flicked to July. On the 25th of the month, there it was. Elspeth Guthrie, aged 35, on the island of Unst, a baby boy, seven pounds, 15 ounces, K.T. I'd been crouching down over the box and I sank to the floor. I sat amidst years of accumulated dust and debris, getting filthy and not caring. I could think of only one reason 
why birth records should be falsified to the extent of recording the adopting mother as the birth mother. Something was so badly wrong with the real birth that it would bear no investigating. Duncan's birth mother had been killed, just like Melissa had been, just like all the others had been. Every three years, island women were being bred in captivity like farm animals and then slaughtered. I wondered whether the legends of the trows had given some maniac the idea in the first place, or whether the stories had sprung from real events taking place in the islands over the years, known about but never discussed, never openly acknowledged, because to do so would be tantamount to admitting you lived among monsters. I'd intended to find the record of Ken's birth too, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Enough was enough. I pushed myself to my feet, put the lid back on the box, and lifted it back onto the shelf. I tucked the ledger under my arm and left the room, willing myself not to run. I switched off the lights and made for the lift. Then I changed my mind, and went in the opposite direction, heading for the stairs, telling myself all the while to stay calm, act calm. No one knew what I'd found out. I was safe for a while. I just had to keep my head. How the hell were they doing it? How do you spirit away a live woman at the same time convincing all her relatives that she's dead? How do you hold a funeral with an empty coffin? Had no one ever taken a last peek and found a pink-lined casket of bricks? I'd made the ground floor. I was ridiculously out of breath. I stopped for a second. They couldn't use semblances, the equivalent of the dying Cathy Morton, for all of them. It just wasn't feasible that enough seriously ill women would be found. The Cathy Melissa switch had to have been a special case. I was back to hypnosis and drugs, to the involvement of enough people to make sure the procedures were never questioned. The doctor would administer the drugs, pronounce death, comfort the family. The pathologist would fill in the forms, make out reports for corpses that didn't exist. Relatives would be discouraged, under any number of pretexts, from viewing the bodies. I was back on my floor. Kirsten. Poor Kirsten, my fellow equestrian. I'd knelt by her grave, tidying the spring flowers and feeling a close empathy because of the way she died. But she hadn't been down there. She was still in my field, the real grave site. She had to be. The instrument sweeps had been a sham. Even the most recent carried out that very day. If Detective Superintendent Harris had been present, well, I'd be interested in finding out where and when he'd been born. I wondered briefly if I'd found out where Stephen Gare had been getting his babies from. Except it still didn't add up. The numbers involved, an average of just two per annum, still seemed far too few to attract the sort of revenues Helen and I had found. Plus the babies I could name, Duncan, Ken, Andy Dunn, Connor Gare, had all been adopted locally. The chances were others had been too. Money might have changed hands, but it couldn't explain the massive amounts, several millions each year, that were coming in from overseas. And it would be too big a risk, surely, to abduct women, keep them prisoner and murder them, just to be able to sell their babies to the highest bidder. No, whatever motive was driving these people, it had to be more than money. The babies being sold were coming from another source. My office appeared as I'd left it. The coffee had brewed, and I poured myself a mug, spilling a good quarter of it in the process. I had to get a grip, or the first person who saw me would know something was up. I think the desk phone must have been ringing for some time before I reached out and picked up the receiver. I was just about to try you at home. It was Helen. I couldn't tell her yet. I needed to get my head together first. If I opened my mouth, I'd probably babble like an idiot. 
Where are you? I managed. Just leaving Tronal. Boy, the wind's getting up. Can you hear me? A flash of panic so sharp it was painful. I'd forgotten Helen was going to Tronal. Are you okay? Who's with you? Tora, I'm fine. What's wrong? What's happened? Nothing. Nothing, just tired, I managed, telling myself to calm down, to take it easy. Big, deep breaths. How was it? Quiet sort of place. Only a few women, most of them asleep. Couple of babies in the nursery. We're going back in the morning. I'll be staying on Unst for a few days. Will I see you soon? She was quiet for a second. I could hear the boat's engine in the background and the whistling of the wind. Are you sure you're okay? She said at last. I'm fine, I said. Then, because it didn't seem enough, I'm on my way home. Dunk and I are going out to dinner. Great, because look, I wanted to ask you something. Something personal, and I didn't really get a chance this morning. Is now a good time? Of course, I said. Now was a great time. I was ready for just about anything. Anything that didn't require thinking, moving, speaking. She lowered her voice. Thing is, I have to start thinking about Dana's funeral. I'm her next of kin, you know. I knew that. My friendly local pathologist had told me so. Dana's funeral. I closed my eyes and found myself in the midst of a sad, solemn gathering. We were in an ancient church, cathedral-like in its dimensions, softly lit by tall white candles. I could smell the candle smoke and the incense that drifted down from the high altar. I know you hadn't known her very long, came Helen's voice from a distance. But I think, well, I think you made quite an impression. On me too, come to that. It would mean a lot if you could be there. Dana's flowers would be white. Roses, orchids and lilies. Stylish and beautiful like the woman herself. Six young constables' uniforms gleaming would carry her to the altar. The back of my throat started to hurt. Tears were rolling down my cheeks and I could no longer see the room around me. Of course. I said, of course I will. Thank you. No, thank you. Helen's voice had deepened. Will it be in Dundee? Do you have a date in mind? No, I'm still waiting to hear from your place about when they can let her go. They need to keep her for a while. I can understand that, of course. I'd just like to get things moving. And the vision froze. The uniformed pallbearers stopped moving. The candles flickered and went out. She's still here. In the hospital? I didn't expect her to hear me. I could barely hear myself. But the wind must have died at just the right moment, because she did. Just for a little while. I have to go. I'll see you. She was gone. I blinked hard. My face was wet, but my eyes were clear. The room that had been swimming just a second ago was thrown into sharp focus. I could see again. I stood up. I could move again. And praise the Lord, I could think again. I grasped in that moment the true and complete meaning of the word epiphany. Because I'd just had one. There was much I still didn't get, but I understood one thing with perfect and absolute clarity. Sorry, Helen. Couldn't oblige, after all. I was not going to be one of Dana's mourners, biting lips and dabbing eyes as we watched her elegant, weightless coffin carried to the grave. I would have no part in the age-old ritual of committing her body to the earth or the flames. This was one funeral I was going nowhere near. Because Dana wasn't dead. Chapter 35 An hour and a half later, I drove onto the Yell Ferry. 
It wasn't quite eight o'clock, but it was going to be the last crossing of the evening. There were dark clouds overhead and a storm was threatening. I sat in my car, shivering in spite of my jacket, and tried not to think about the waves that were beating against the ferry as it pushed its way across the yell sound. When the ferryman came to collect my fare, I asked him what he thought the wind speed was. It was a force five gusting six, he said, and forecast to increase before the night was out. And I didn't want to dwell on what other storms might break before the sun came up. I was filled with a sense of my every action being for the last time. Just before leaving the hospital, I'd phoned home. Duncan hadn't answered, and I couldn't face trying his mobile. I left a message that there'd been an emergency at the hospital and I would be working late. I added that I loved him. Partly because it was true, and partly because I wasn't sure I was ever going to be able to say it to him again. Small creatures were dancing a samba in my stomach as the ferry docked, and I was off again. I had further to drive, but that was all to the good. I needed darkness for what I was planning, and a bit more time to drum up enough courage. On the other hand, if I thought about it too much, I'd definitely chicken out. I'd taken out one small insurance policy. I'd put the ledger from the basement, several computer printouts, and a hastily scribbled note in a brown envelope. On my way out of Lerwick, I dropped by Dana's house and left it conspicuously on the fridge in her kitchen. Sometime in the next few days, Helen would find it. If I didn't come back, she'd know where I'd gone and why. Whatever happened, I was not going to disappear without trace. Helen and her team had spent most of the day on Tronal and were staying on nearby Unst that night. The Tronal people would be wary. Anything they had to hide would be well hidden. They'd be watching the north and northeastern approaches to the island. Any boat setting off from Unst would be spotted in good time and plenty of warning given. I could not hope to approach the island stealthily from that direction. So I wasn't going to try. At Gutcher on Yell, there is a small sailing club close to the pier. It has about twenty Yell-based members and is affiliated to its neighbouring club on Unst. I had a key that I knew would get me into the shed that passed as a clubhouse. Once in there, I'd break into the cupboard that held spare boat keys. That was the easy bit. After that, I'd have to rig up an unfamiliar boat in the dark, sail it single-handed in winds that were verging on storm conditions, in waters I barely knew, towards an area of notoriously treacherous navigation. Even that wasn't the hard bit. Jesus, what the hell was I thinking? I parked. To my relief and disappointment, in equal parts, the car park was empty and the clubhouse in darkness. Anything getting in my way at this stage I'd have taken as a sign not to go on. It took just a few seconds to break into the cupboard and find the keys I was looking for. I took some waterproofs and a life jacket and made my way down to the jetty. Duncan and Richard had a friend on Yell who was a keen sailor. He'd recently bought one of the new sport boats, and he'd taken Duncan and me out in it several times. It was a sailing boat, built for speed, but with a deep keel, giving it greater stability than the average dinghy. It had an engine for when the wind wasn't on your side, a small covered cabin for when the weather wasn't, and an anchor so you could park at sea. I was about to add grand larceny to the list of complaints the police and other island authorities had against me. But hell, maybe I wouldn't live to face the music. The jetty, fifty years old if it was a day, rocked beneath me. The wind whipped my hair up and I guessed it had risen to a force six. Any greater, and I would be taking a stupid risk with my own life. I was probably doing that anyway. Marinas are never silent places, 
and when strong winds whistle through them, the noise can really jar on the nerves. Several boats were moored against the jetty, and their riggings were twanging and humming like so many high-pitched, discordant guitars. Several of them clanged together, and even in the relative shelter of the marina, small waves were banging aggressively against hulls. It did not augur well for conditions out at sea. I found the boat, climbed aboard, and unlocked the cabin, only to have a debilitating attack of nerves. I made myself focus on getting the boat ready one step at a time. If there was anything I couldn't do, that would be the sign to give up. I fixed the jib in place and threaded the sheets. I attached the mainsail and released the kicker. I checked fuel and the instruments. Expecting every second to hear a yell of outrage, I finished faster than expected. And I'd calmed down a little. Our friend had local charts on board, and I studied them for some time. From the marina at Gutcha, I would sail directly southeast for about a mile, hidden behind a small, uninhabited island called Linga. Once I cleared Linga, I could alter my course and head directly west towards Tronul. There were cliffs on its western edge, but also an area of sloping beach. I'd be able to anchor if I got that far. Telling myself it was now or never, I released the stern line, made a slip knot on the bow, and started the engine. I put the boat into reverse and pulled slowly out of the marina. No one saw me, or if they did, no one called or raised the alarm. As I left the harbour, a wave came crashing over the starboard bow, hitting me full in the face. I had not imagined it would be so cold. I pulled my hood up and fastened the strings tight. The sky was thick with cloud and darkness was falling fast. I'd put the chart into a plastic cover and hung it from the instrument panel. Pretty soon, with visibility down to virtually zero, I'd need to check it every few minutes. I turned the boat sharply to starboard, and I was in the channel. Between Linga and Yell, now the waves were hitting me head on. Every couple of seconds, wham! We slammed into another, and its freezing particles came hurtling over the bow. I was soon soaked. I was leaving the lights of Gutcha behind me. On either side, land rose up like dark shadows. The engine was a small one, struggling to make four knots and far too noisy. If I were to get to Tronal in less than an hour and not be heard, I'd have to sail. I started to haul up the mainsail. Immediately, the boat began to heel. It took every ounce of courage I had to unfurl the jib, but I knew I wouldn't have enough stability without it. I pulled it out halfway. The sail filled, the boat accelerated away, and I switched off the engine. Within minutes, the speed was up to seven knots, and the boat was heeling at a thirty-degree angle. I was braced against the side of the boat to stay upright as we slammed into waves that felt like brick walls. But I was making progress, and I was in control. Just. I hunkered down in the cockpit. Every strong gust of wind threatened to pitch the boat onto its side. With one hand, I held tightly onto the stick. The other held the main sheet. Every time I felt the tiller pushing out of control, I released the tension in the main and clung on for dear life, until the boat righted itself again. All too soon, I'd reached the southernmost tip of Linga, and had to leave the shelter of the channel. I turned the boat to port, and altered the sails. The wind was now coming over the port stern. And the boat stopped heeling and came upright again. The sails filled, and my speed picked up, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half knots. At this rate, as long as I didn't jibe, I'd be at Tronal in no time. And what the hell was I going to find there? Helen had been wrong.
Helen was a fine police officer and she'd done what she'd been trained to do. She'd stuck to the facts. But the facts only took us so far. They took us to Tronal being the centre of a scheme involving the illegal sale of babies, to Stephen Gare being head of the operation, assisted by Dunn and several others, identities still to be determined. They took us to Melissa being murdered to protect the operation, brilliantly dispatched in a way that in the normal course of events would never have been suspected, even if her body had been discovered. But the facts didn't explain her strange ritualistic burial on my land instead of being conveniently dumped at sea. They didn't, paternal bonding aside, explain Gare taking the enormous risk of holding her prisoner for long enough for their baby to be born. They didn't explain Kirsten's wedding ring being found in my field. Nor could the facts explain the regular rise in the female death rate, followed a year later by a batch of baby boys, incorrectly and illegally registered as the birth children of their adoptive mothers. To explain all that, you had to take a giant leap of faith, which Helen had been unable to do, but which Dana had been veering towards and at which I, finally, had arrived. Here on Shetland, legend lived. The trows of so many island stories were real, dwelling among humans, passing for human. Of course, I knew that if you were to dissect the bodies of these trows, carry out every known medical test on their blood, their DNA, their bone structure, they'd be no different, anatomically, from any other human male. But, crucial point here, they believed themselves to be different from the rest of the human race, to have different rights, different responsibilities, to be subject not to ordinary human laws, but to a code of their own that was self-determined, self-administered, and self-monitored. The boat sped along as total darkness fell. The compass told me I was on track. The chart told me there were no immediate hazards ahead. But otherwise... I was running blind. A few twinkling beacons aside, I was sailing in a thick, black void. Vague shadows on the almost invisible horizon suggested islands or large rocks around me, but none was close yet. The depth gauge had given up, unable to calculate a depth too immense to measure. Logically, that was reassuring, but I really didn't like to think of the black fathoms beneath me. I sailed on, thinking instead about what would be waiting for me on Tronal. History offers countless examples of the self-proclaimed master race. That had to be what I was dealing with now. A group of men who believed themselves to be intrinsically superior to the rest of us. Up in this remote corner of the world, a few dozen island men were operating their own private kingdom. Running the police, the local government, the health service, the schools, the Chamber of Commerce, they had control over every aspect of island life, automatically assuming the best jobs, the plum contracts, entry to the best clubs, making themselves rich with a complex mix of legal and illegal trading. Since the discovery of the North Sea oil fields, the Shetland Islands had enjoyed unprecedented economic prosperity and a group of local men were taking full advantage. It was the Masons meets the Mafia, with an extra bit of nastiness thrown in. Of course, as evening became nighttime, I asked myself why these men couldn't just leave it at that, marry and mate like other men and enjoy the fruits of their little fiefdom. Why did they have to kidnap, rape, and murder the mothers of their sons? That dreadful process, I guessed, and the very small number of boys born out of it, would go to the very heart of their distinctness. Their rarity made them, in their eyes at least, immeasurably special. 
Boys born into the trial community would face a stark choice. Accept what they were, enjoy the enormous advantages, and deal with the horrific reality of how they were made, or leave and risk the destruction of everything and everyone they'd been taught to value. I knew now that Duncan had no desire to leave me. It was the life he wanted out of. I knew why he'd been so depressed about the move back to Shetland, in spite of the huge advantages it had offered him. Why our relationship had been under such strain. Duncan was fighting the forces that had drawn him back to the islands. My heart went out to him, but it was a battle he'd have to fight alone for now. I had problems of my own to deal with, and in any event, I sensed he wasn't winning. A mass of darkness ahead of me was growing blacker, taking a shape more solid than the night around it. I thought I could even see small lights. I was nearing Tronal. I furled the jib, and the boat slowed by a couple of knots. I could make out bumps and ridges in the cliffs, and see a lighter area that must be the sand of the beach. The depth gauge was working now. Fifteen metres, fourteen, thirteen. Waves were breaking on the shore. Ten metres, nine. I was about to turn the boat so that it was heading directly into wind to allow me to drop the sails when I spotted rocks off the port side. The starboard side looked clear, but I'd have to turn the boat round nearly three hundred degrees, and I wasn't sure I had the speed any more. I looked again to port. More rocks. I was in five metres of water, four, three. As fast as I could, I reached forward, pulled up the keel, and released the mainsail. Then I closed my eyes and held on tight to the stick. The wind was behind us and the boat continued forward until a scraping sound under the hull and a massive jerk forward told me we'd hit the beach. We travelled another yard or so, then stopped. I collected what I needed from the cabin and then came up top again. I stood on the narrow deck, staring at Tronal, the geographical fortress I was about to storm. Since the dawn of time, People have surrounded themselves by water to protect against invasion. But it wasn't just the island I was facing. It was the fortress of the Trows, an invisible but complex structure run by very powerful men. They were strong. They could hypnotize people. It was little use telling myself that they were, after all, only men. For generations past, they'd convinced themselves that they were different. At the end of the day, if you believe something deeply enough, it becomes a kind of truth. Chapter 36 The beach was narrow, sloping upwards, scattered with boulders that gleamed black in the darkness. On all sides, low, jagged cliffs reared above me. They seemed to be moving, and I almost cried out, then relaxed. The cliffs were home to hundreds of nesting seabirds, gulls or fulmers, I couldn't tell, white bellies squirming, wings fluttering, heads nodding against the black of the granite cliffs. I pulled the anchor from its locker and walked several paces up the beach until I could wedge it behind a small rock. Assuming I made it back to the beach, the boat would be waiting for me. I tugged on a small backpack I'd brought with me and set off. I started towards the lowest point on the cliff. It was far too dark to see clearly, and every few seconds I tripped or slid. At the edge of the beach I began to climb. After a few yards the pebbles gave way to thin soil, some scattered clumps of grass and coarse, springy heather. It wasn't steep, but I was breathing heavily when I reached the top. A barbed wire fence ringed the upper part of the island, but I was prepared for it. With the aid of a small pair of pliers from the boat, I'd soon cut a way through. After that, there was a stone wall about waist high. I climbed over, taking care not to dislodge any of the loose stones. 
I looked round, found a stone that had fallen, and placed it on top of the wall as a rough marker of where I'd cut the wire. Keeping low, I looked around me. Tronal is a small island, oval in shape, roughly a mile long and a third of a mile wide, with three stubby promontories at its southeastern edge. It is fifty metres above sea level at its highest point, pretty much the place where I was crouching. Looking north, I could see the lights of Uwe Sound on Unst, and also several down on Tronal's tiny marina. A single pier, new and solidly built, jutted out from the small natural harbour. Several boats, including a large white cruiser, were moored there. A Land Rover was parked near the jetty. I thought I could see movement around it. From the harbour, a rough, single-track road led across the island to the only buildings that were visible. Almost in the centre of the island, the terrain rose and then dipped, forming a natural hollow in which the buildings nestled. I dropped lower and started making my way towards them. Instinct told me to stay close to the hillside, to move as quickly as the rough ground allowed. At one point I thought I heard voices, ten minutes later the sound of a boat engine, but the wind was still strong and I couldn't be sure. After about fifteen minutes of ducking and scrambling, I could see lights not too far away from me. I climbed the hill to its summit and lay down on the coarse, prickly grass. Below me, not fifteen metres away, was the clinic. It was a one-storey building, made of local stone with a high slate roof, built around a square and with a central courtyard. A gated archway in the northwestern elevation permitted vehicular access to the courtyard. The gates stood open. Dormer windows appeared at regular intervals along the roof, six to a side. Only a few lights shone from the building itself, but the area surrounding it was dimly lit by a series of small lights set along the gravel pathways. I set off again, keeping a good distance away, to inspect the building from all angles before deciding whether it was safe to approach. Moving south, away from the gate, I found a whole row of dark rooms. Blinds weren't drawn, but I could make out nothing inside them. The southeastern side was busy. Several windows had blinds up and lights on. I sank back into the shadows and watched. There were men inside. I managed to count half a dozen, but couldn't be sure there weren't more. Three, maybe four, were in some sort of common room. I could see easy chairs and a TV on the wall. Another two were in a large kitchen that gleamed with stainless steel. Some of the men wore jeans and sweaters. A couple were dressed in white surgical scrubs. They stood around, chatting, drinking from mugs. One of the men in the kitchen was smoking, his cigarette held out of an open window. My watch told me it was just after ten o'clock. A normal hospital would be quietening down for the night. No sign of that here. I crouched low, thinking about video surveillance, security lights, alarms. If this building were the prison I believed it to be, it would surely have all of those. Turning another corner, I found a row of eight windows, all of which had blinds drawn. I moved on. There was a row of outbuildings about ten metres away from the house. I planned to hide behind them. I must have been about six metres away from the sheds when there came a terrifying explosion of sound, the manic barking of several large dogs. I dropped to the ground, curling instinctively into the tightest ball I could manage, tucking my hands into my chest. The barking grew in intensity. Claws scratched against wood. Animals yelped, hurting each other in their urgency to reach me, to be the first to tear me apart. Nothing happened. I didn't hear the pounding of large paws. Jagged teeth didn't clamp down on my flesh. But the cacophonous din continued, the dogs getting more and more furious with themselves, with me, with the situation. 
with a relief that almost made me pass out, I realised they couldn't reach me. They were locked up. I forced myself to uncurl and start crawling. I went back the way I'd come, back towards the common room and kitchen. As my scent faded, the dogs began to calm. After a few more seconds, I heard a male voice talking to them, soothing them. The television in the common room was turned on, and several of the men were gathered around it, watching with interest. With any luck, it might distract them for a while. Also, whilst my recent encounter with the canine world had left me shaking violently, I realised the presence of dogs was good news, just so long as they remained locked up. If guard dogs provided the island security, they might rely less on devices like alarms and cameras. Of course, once the dogs were loose, my life expectancy stood at around ten minutes. The kitchen was empty, the smoker's window still open. It was a stupid, ridiculous risk to even think about taking with most of the clinic staff in the next room. Far better to creep back across the island, climb onto my boat and sail to Unst, try and convince Helen to come back here sooner than planned, to take Tronal by surprise. That way, I might just be alive when the sun came up. But would Dana? Glancing round, I saw a tall bush and ran for it. Behind it, I unhooked my backpack and pulled off my waterproofs. Underneath were the scrubs I'd been wearing all day. I pulled a cap onto my head and tucked my hair up inside it. Seen quickly and at a distance, it was just possible I wouldn't set alarm bells ringing. I ran forward, paused to check the kitchen was still empty and climbed in. The volume of the TV next door was turned up loud and I was pretty certain no one had heard me come in. I clambered over a steel worktop, dropped to the floor and listened hard. Nothing but the low chanting of a sports crowd on the TV and an occasional expletive from the next room. I leaned over and pulled the window down until it was almost but not quite closed. With luck, anyone glancing at it would think it shut and locked. I crossed the kitchen and gently opened the door. The corridor was empty and I set off left, away from the common room. Looking up, I could see cameras tucked away in the corner between wall and ceiling. I just had to hope they weren't being monitored. I walked slowly, silently, alert every second for the slightest noise that would tell me someone was approaching. Along the wall on my right-hand side were occasional windows showing a dim view of the internal courtyard. Across the courtyard was another lit and windowed corridor. It would not be easy to remain unseen. From the outside, the building had looked old, but once inside, I didn't think it could be. It was just too regular, too clean and modern in its construction, the windows large and frequent. On my left were rooms. Most had closed doors, one with light shining under that I passed by quickly. Two had open doors, and I glanced inside. The first was an office, desk, computer terminal, glass-fronted bookcase. The second was some sort of meeting room. I came to the end of the corridor and found a door to my right leading out into the courtyard. On my left were the steel double doors of a large lift and a flight of stairs. I started to climb. Seven steps up, and the stairs made a 180-degree turn. There was a fire door at the top. I opened it and glanced through. The corridor was narrow and windowless. Dim spotlights were evenly spaced along the low ceiling. I counted six doors along my right-hand side. Each had a small shuttered window. I slid back the first shutter. 
The room beyond was dark, but I could make out a narrow, hospital-style bed with tubular framing and a pale-coloured cabinet by its side. Also an easy chair and a small TV mounted on the wall. Someone lay in the bed, but the covers were pulled up high and I had no way of telling whether the someone was young or old, male or female, dead or alive. I moved on to the next window. Same setup, except this time, as I watched, the figure in the bed moved, turning over and stretching before settling down again. The next room was empty. So was the fourth. There was light in the fifth room. A woman sat in the armchair, reading a magazine. She looked up and we made eye contact. Then she dropped her magazine, put both hands on the arms of her chair and pushed herself up. She was wearing pyjamas and a dressing gown. She was pregnant. She came towards the door. Every nerve ending I had was on fire, but I knew if I ran now, the game would be up. She opened the door and tilted her head slightly to one side. Hello, she said. All I could do was stare back. Creases appeared on her forehead and her eyes narrowed. Sorry, I managed. Long day, four hours in theatre, brain not really functioning any more. How are you feeling? She relaxed and stepped back, inviting me into her room. I went in, closing the door behind me and making sure the window shutter was pulled across. I'm OK, she said. Bit nervous. Mr. Mortensen said he would give me something to help me sleep, but I guess he's been busy. She leaned back against the bed. We're still OK for tomorrow, aren't we? I forced myself to smile at her. Haven't heard anything to the contrary. Thank Christ, I, I just want to get it over with now. I really need to get back to work. A termination. Dana had told me the clinic carried them out. This woman, at least, was here voluntarily. Have I seen you before? she was asking me. I shook my head. Don't think so. How long have you been here? Five days now. I really need to get home. I thought it would just take 24 hours. I've been away for a week, I said, just back on duty this afternoon. I haven't managed to look at your notes yet. Have there been complications? She sighed and pushed herself up so that she was sitting on the bed. Just about everything you can think of. Blood pressure sky high, apparently, although it's never been a problem in the past. Sugar and protein in my urine. Traces of a viral infection in my blood. Although why that should stop you going ahead is beyond me. It was beyond me, too. It all sounded like complete nonsense. Something was starting to feel very wrong. I glanced at the notes pinned to the foot of her bed, found her name. Emma, can I have a quick look at your tummy? She lay back on the bed and pulled her dressing gown open. She was a striking-looking woman, probably in her late twenties, tall, with vivid blonde hair showing just a fraction of dark roots. Her eyes were large and light brown in colour, her lips plump and very red, her teeth white and perfect. I started to press my hands very gently on her abdomen. Immediately, something kicked back. I glanced up at Emma, but her face had tightened. She wouldn't make eye contact. What do you do for a living, Emma? I asked her, as my hands travelled upwards. She smiled. I'm an actress, she said, with the air of someone who'd waited a long time to say those words and who hadn't quite got used to the thrill of doing so. I've just got a lead in the West End, she named a musical I'd vaguely heard of. My understudy has been filling in, but if I'm not back soon, they might give her the job permanently. I finished my examination and thanked her. I was far from happy. I went back to the foot of the bed and picked up her notes again. On the second page, I found what I was looking for. LMP 
3rd November, 2006. I stared at the tubular frame of the bedpost while I tried to do the calculation in my head. Then I flicked through the rest of the notes. I looked up. Emma was sitting up now and had been watching me. Her eyes looked cautious, her lips set straight. Emma, it says here that your last menstrual period was on the 3rd of November. Does that sound about right? She nodded. Which would make you... about 27, 28 weeks? She nodded again, more slowly. For a second, all I could do was stare at her. Then I went back to her notes, checking and rechecking everything I found there. She started to push herself forward on the bed. Don't tell me now this is going to be a problem. I've been promised. No, no. I held up both hands. Please, don't be concerned. As I said, I'm just catching up. I'll let you get some rest now. I glanced at her notes once more and then moved towards the door. She sat on the bed, watching me the way a cat watches someone moving around a room. At the door I stopped and turned. How did you hear about Tronal, Emma? If you work in the West End, you must live in London. You've come a long way. She nodded slowly, still wary of me. I'll say, she agreed. I went to a clinic in London. They said they couldn't help me, but they had some leaflets. Leaflets about Tronal? A small shake of the head. Tronal wasn't mentioned. I had no idea it'd have to come to Shetland. The leaflet said something about advice and counselling for pregnant women in their second and third trimesters. There was a phone number. And you called it. Somewhere in the building, a sound rang out. I tried not to let Emma see me stiffen. I didn't have anything to lose. I met a doctor in a room just off Harley Street. He referred me here. I had to move on. I forced a smile at Emma and looked at my watch. I'll be seeing Mr. Mortensen in about an hour, I said. I can check with him then about giving you something to help you sleep. Will you be okay till then? She nodded and seemed to relax a little. I gave her a last smile and left the room. With luck, she'd wait an hour before following up on my promise. I had an hour, at best. Back in the corridor, I leaned against the wall, needing a moment to get my breath, to clear my head. Like most obstetricians, I'm trained to carry out terminations, and since being on Shetland, I'd performed three. I don't enjoy it, don't particularly approve of it as a general rule, but I respect the law of the land, and a woman's right, to be the ultimate determiner of what happens to her own body. Under no circumstances, however, would I have agreed to carry out Emma's termination. Compared to the rest of Europe, the UK's laws on abortion are fairly relaxed. Too relaxed, many would argue. Here, up to the 24th week of pregnancy, an abortion can be legally carried out, providing that two doctors agree the risk to a woman's health or the risk to her children's health will be greater if she continues with the pregnancy than if she ends it. This usually amounts to doctors supporting a woman's decision to terminate and has become known as social abortion, a practice many deplore. After the 24th week, termination is only permitted if there's medical evidence that the woman's life or health would be seriously threatened by continuing with the pregnancy or if the child is expected to be born severely handicapped. Looking carefully through Emma's notes, I'd found no valid reason why the procedure was being carried out so late. Nothing in her notes suggested either a serious deformity in the fetus or a significant threat to Emma's own life. The pregnancy was normal. Inconvenient, obviously, but otherwise quite normal. I wondered how much Emma had paid for her illegal operation. Why on earth they'd kept her here for five days on ridiculous pretenses instead of performing the operation straight away? 
and how many other desperate women arrived here every year, seeking a procedure unavailable to them anywhere else in Europe. I moved on. I pulled the next window back an inch and looked through. This time the woman inside was sitting up in bed watching television. The woman, no, girl, she couldn't have been more than sixteen, looked pregnant too, although it was impossible to be sure. If I had time to watch her, she'd undoubtedly give herself away. Pregnant women instinctively adapt both their usual pattern of movement and their posture in order to protect the growing fetus. Sooner or later, she dressed her hands on her abdomen, raised herself up without putting pressure on stomach muscles, rub her back gently. I moved on and turned the corner. I passed six rooms, all of them empty, and turned another corner. The first room on the next corner was empty. The bed was bare, pillows without pillowcases piled up, a folded yellow blanket but no sheets. The next room was a twin of the first. The third was empty, but looked ready to receive a patient. I stepped inside. The bed was neatly made. White towels were folded on the armchair. A flower-patterned nightdress, clean, perfectly ironed and folded, lay at the foot of the bed. On the walls hung several prints of wild flowers. It looked exactly like a neat, clean, comfortable room in an exclusive private hospital. Except for the four metal shackles chained to each corner of the bed. I backed out and pulled the door towards me, careful to leave it slightly ajar exactly as I'd found it. As I discovered two days ago, the death rate among young Shetland females peaked every three years. The last peak had occurred in 2004, the year Melissa and Kirsten were believed to have died. It was now May 2007, three years later. Three more rooms. I wasn't sure I wanted to see what was inside. The handle of the next room moved and the door opened. A small bedside lamp gave just enough light. The woman on the bed looked around twenty. She had dark brown hair and thick, dark eyelashes, the willowy slenderness of the very young, and perfect white skin. She lay as if sleeping, breathing deeply and evenly, but flat on her back, her legs straight and close together, her arms by her side. People rarely sleep naturally in such a posture, and I guessed she'd been sedated. The blanket over her lay taut across her stomach. I wandered to the foot of the bed, but there were no notes, just a single name, Freya. There were shackles on her bed but they hung loose, reaching nearly to the floor. I tiptoed out. The woman in the fifth room looked older, but like the girl in the previous room, she lay in an unnaturally still state of sleep on the narrow bed. Her name was Odell, and her feet, though not her arms, were manacled. Odell? Freya? Who were these two women? How had they arrived here? Did they have families somewhere, grieving for them, believing them dead? I wondered if I'd seen either of them before, whether they'd passed through the hospital. Neither looked familiar. Neither showed any sign of being already pregnant. I wondered where they'd been that day, during Helen's visit, where they'd be hidden when she returned tomorrow. I pushed open the last door, noticing, as I did so, the pyjamas folded neatly on the armchair. They were white linen, with an embroidered scallop pattern around the collar, cuffs and ankles. They were laundered, pristine, showing no trace of the blood that had turned them a soft pink the last time I'd seen them. I turned to the bed, knowing that I'd stopped breathing, but seemingly unable to start again. Someone lay in it. 
I walked over and stared down at the face on the pillow. I know that I cried out, part yelp, part sob. In spite of everything I'd been through, in spite of the immense danger I was still in, such a wave of joy hit me that it was all I could do not to dance round the room, punching the air and yelling. I forced myself to be calm and reached under the covers. Two days ago, I'd arrived at Dana's house, exhausted and scared, already dreading that something terrible had happened to her. I would have been putty in the hands of a skilled hypnotist, planting ideas in my head, ideas already there in a half-formed state. Must have been child's play for Andy Dunn. I couldn't believe how arrogantly stupid I'd been not to think of it before. The wrist I held had been dressed with fine white bandages. I leaned over and found the other, just the same. I was glad I hadn't imagined the ugly, bleeding gashes I'd seen in Dana's bathroom. Her wrists had been cut, but probably only superficially. She would have lost blood, but not so much it couldn't be replaced once she arrived on Tronal. I hadn't felt a pulse in Dana's bathroom, whatever drug she'd been given had made her peripheral pulse undetectable. But I could feel one, strong and regular, now. As I'd sat trembling and close to fainting in Andy Dunn's car, I'd heard the sirens of an ambulance approaching. Dunn had driven me straight to the hospital, and I'd assumed the ambulance was following with Dana, but it wasn't. Instead, Dana had been brought here. For what? to be part of this summer's breeding program? I bent down. Dana, can you hear me? It's Tora. Dana, can you wake up? I stroked her forehead, risked giving her shoulders a shake. Nothing, not even a flicker. This was not a normal sleep. A door slammed and footsteps were coming down the corridor. Voices were talking softly but urgently. I had seconds. I looked at the narrow, upright cupboard, wasn't sure I'd fit inside. The bathroom. I crossed the room and pulled open the door. There was a lavatory, wash basin and shower cubicle. No window. I pulled open the door of the cubicle, jumped in and crouched down. If someone entered the room, they couldn't help but see me. I would just have to hope. Maybe they weren't even heading for Dana's room. Maybe my luck would hold a bit longer. The footsteps stopped. The door to Dana's room opened. The draught it caused blew the bathroom door open another inch. For a moment there was silence. Then, What do you think? asked a voice that sounded remarkably like that of my father-in-law. I realised my luck had run out. Well, she's bright, healthy, good-looking, answered the voice I knew better than any other in the whole world. Seems like... like a bit of a waste, he continued, and I didn't know whether I was going to scream or be sick. Exactly, said the voice of Detective Inspector Andrew Dunn. Why the hell go to the risk of getting another one? I sat in the shower cubicle, shivering so violently it hurt, and thinking, Why? Why did I come here? This was an unforgivable risk, came another voice, one that sounded vaguely familiar, but that I couldn't quite place. You were told to get rid of her, not bring her here. Yeah, well, sorry about the reality check, snapped Dunn but even I can't hypnotise someone into slashing their own wrists. And haven't we learned by now that if we rush an accident, we mess it up? She's half Indian, said the man, whose voice I couldn't put my finger on. We don't pollute the bloodstream. Oh, for God's sake, spat Dunn. What is this, the Middle Ages? Robert is right, said my father-in-law. She isn't suitable. Robert? Did I know a Robert? Oh, God, I did. I'd met him just over a week ago. 
Robert Tully and his wife Sarah had come to see me about their inability to conceive a child. The bastard had sat in my office, pretending to need my help, knowing his wife wanted a baby so much that she was close to breaking point. Was she, then, intended to be the adopting mother of one of the latest batch of trial babies? All right, my husband was saying. What do we do with Miss Tullock, then? We'll take her in the boat with the other two, answered Richard. When we're far enough out, I'll give her another doze and slip her over the side. She won't know anything about it. I need a leak, said Duncan. Won't be a sec. The bathroom door opened and Duncan came into the room. He was still wearing the charcoal grey business suit I'd watched him put on that morning. He walked to the basin and leaned over it. And what do we tell the girlfriend? asked Dunn. We send her a coffin, said Richard. Leave it till the last minute. Day of the funeral, if we can. Someone goes with it in case she wants to view the body. No big deal, we've done it before. Okay, then. Settled. No, what else do we have to do? Duncan turned on one of the taps and splashed water over his face. He sighed deeply and straightened up. In the mirror above the basin, I had time to notice the tie that I had given him at Christmas, tiny pink elephants on navy blue silk. A second later, we made eye contact. Patients in one and two we don't have to worry about, replied Richard. Standard adoptions, both likely to deliver in the next couple of weeks. The Rowley woman spoke to both of them today. Shouldn't think she'll want to bother again. What about Emma Leonard? Aren't you due to deliver her tomorrow? Duncan had turned to face me. I braced myself for him to shout out, alert the others, or even worse, to laugh. I wondered what they were going to do to me, how much it would hurt, whether it would be quick, whether Duncan would be the one who... We're going ahead, said Richard. Once the operation's over, I'll keep her sedated. We can't risk her talking. I tried to get up. I didn't want to be caught, crouched, damp-assed in a shower cubicle. But I couldn't move. All I could do was stare at Duncan. All he did was stare back. Isn't Emma safer on the boat? In the outer room they were still talking, oblivious to the silent drama being played out in the bathroom. She would be, if we could be sure the police will only be here one more day. We can't hold on to her much longer, she's getting very edgy. Better to get it over with and get her out of here. And the woman in room six? I think we'll be okay, She's only twenty-six weeks anyway, plus she's insisting to everyone who'll listen that all the scans are wrong and she's just twenty weeks. I've already changed her notes. It's risky. Tell me something I don't know. One of us had to break the deadlock. One of us had to move, say something, shout out loud. I would do it. Anything was better than this unbearable tension. Then Duncan put one finger to his mouth. He glared at me as he left the room, pulling the door firmly closed behind him. A cargo of three, then, Richard. Sure you'll be okay on your own? Don't want to leave it till dawn? No. I want to be well away before there's any chance of the police coming back. Right. I'm going downstairs to get that TV switched off. There's work to do. Footsteps faded away down the corridor. Had they all gone? Could I risk moving? What the hell was Duncan going to do? Dana's room was silent. I started to push myself up. Sorry, mate, said Duncan, as though commiserating with a friend on losing a tennis match. It really doesn't do to get involved. Oh, and you didn't with Tora, shot back Dunn, his voice thick with bitterness. Did he actually care for Dana? Was that why he'd saved her life against orders? Why he'd been arguing to keep her alive for a few months longer? 
You look like shit. Been here all day? In the basement, replied Dunn, with three sedated women. Felt like the House of Horrors. Police nearly found the door at one point. Probably will tomorrow. We'll sort it. Have it looking like a dusty old storeroom by morning. Right, we need a trolley. Can you get one from downstairs? There's something... A furious, terrified yell broke through the night just as the door of the bathroom started to move inwards. Next door, sighed Dunn. Footsteps ran from Dana's room and I heard a struggle in the next room along. There was banging and then a low, terrified whimpering, a noise I might have thought came from an animal, except I knew it wasn't an animal they were keeping chained up in there. Then the bathroom door opened and Duncan reappeared. What the hell are you doing here? he hissed at me. Jesus, you idiot, you fucking idiot! He opened the door of the cubicle, reached in and pulled me up. How the hell did you get here? I couldn't reply, couldn't do anything but stare at him. He waited a split second before shaking me. Boat, he said. Did you come by boat? I was able to nod. Where is it? Beach, I managed. What did it matter if they found the boat? There was no way I was going to get away now. We need to get you back to it, now. He took my arm and started to drag me out of the room. I found the strength to pull back. No, not that easy, Duncan. I wasn't going to be that easy. Then Duncan grasped me close, wrapped both arms around me and put one hand over my mouth. I could hear something, a clanging, whirring sound, then footsteps returning along the corridor. They were coming back. Creaking, sliding noises told me they were bringing trolleys with them. I wanted to struggle against Duncan, but he pressed his mouth against my ear and whispered, Shh! The door to Dana's room slammed open. A trolley was wheeled inside. I heard footsteps moving around the room, the sound of covers being pulled back. A voice I didn't know muttered a countdown. Three, two, one, lift! And there was a soft thud. Strip the bed, bring the chains, said another voice. Then I heard the trolley being pushed out of the room. Beside me, Duncan let out a noisy breath. From the next room along the corridor came similar, if fainter, sounds. I thought I heard someone cry out, but couldn't be sure. For a few seconds, the corridor outside was as noisy as that of any normal hospital. Then the footsteps and the sound of the wheels faded. I heard the clanging noise of the lift's mechanism, and then nothing. Silence. Duncan spun me round to face him. He was white, except for red blotches around his eyes. I'd never seen him so angry. Except it wasn't anger. He was afraid. Tora, you have got to get a hold of yourself or you are going to die. Do you understand what I'm... No, don't you dare cry. He pulled me close again. Listen, baby, listen, he whispered as he swayed gently, the way a mother might rock a child. I can get you out of the clinic, but then you have to get back to the boat. Can you do that? He didn't wait for a reply. Head for you, he sound. Get as far from the island as possible, then get on the radio to your policewoman friend. Can you do that? I didn't know, but I think I nodded. Duncan opened the bathroom door, and we slipped out. Dana's room was empty. The bed had been stripped back to the mattress, and her pyjamas were gone. If I'd been fifteen minutes later, I'd never even have seen her. Duncan walked to the door and looked out. Then he beckoned me forward, grabbed my hand, and pulled me into the deserted corridor. I wasn't sure my legs would carry me, but they worked fine. We rounded a corner, ran down a short fourth corridor, and made it to the stairs. Duncan paused at the top. We could hear nothing below, so risked running down to the midsection. A camera fastened high on the wall glared down at us. We listened again. Nothing. We ran to the bottom of the stairs and found ourselves in a short corridor, twin to the one above. One door stood open on our left. 
I glanced inside. It was an operating suite. Small room where the anaesthetics would be administered, then an open door into theatre. Duncan pulled me onwards. We were now in the wing of the building I'd been watching when I'd disturbed the dogs. The rooms had been occupied. I'd seen light and movement behind them. We had to move quickly. Someone could appear at any time. We walked forward, reached the first door. The glass window showed only darkness. We moved on. Another door, another window. Light beyond. Duncan stopped and I was able to peer through. The room was well lit, about twenty metres long by eight wide. As far as I could make out, there was no one inside. At least... Duncan tugged again, but this time I held firm. Come on, he mouthed at me, but I shook my head. A sign on the door read, Sterile area, strictly no unauthorised admittance. Pulling my hand out of Duncan's grasp, I pushed open the door and went inside. I was in a neonatal intensive care unit. The air temperature was several degrees warmer than that of the corridor and heavy with the continuous humming of electronic equipment. Around me I saw ultrasound scanners, a retcam, paediatric ventilators, a transcutaneous oxygen monitor. Several of the machines emitted soft, beeping sounds every few seconds. Dana had been right. It was state-of-the-art. I'd worked in some very modern, well-equipped facilities in my time, but I'd never seen such a concentration of the very latest equipment. Tora, we don't have time. Duncan had followed me into the room, was tugging at my shoulder. There were ten incubators. Eight of them were empty. I walked across the room, no longer caring if someone found us. I had to see. The infant in the incubator was female. She was about eleven inches long and I guessed would weigh around three pounds. Her skin was red, her eyes tightly closed, and her head, tucked inside a knitted pink cap, seemed unnaturally large for her tiny, emaciated body. A thin, transparent tube ran into both nostrils, connected by sticking plaster to her face. Another tube ran into a vein on her wrist. I found myself wanting to reach in through the hand access to touch her softly. I wondered how little human touch she'd known in her short life. The longer I looked, the more I wanted to scoop her up, hold her to me and run, although I knew that to do such a thing would be to kill her. I moved on, towards the next cot. Duncan followed, no longer trying to stop me. This baby was male, even smaller than the girl. He looked as though he'd be lucky to make two pounds, but his skin was the same dark, blotchy red. A ventilator was breathing for him. A monitor by the cot gave a continual reading of his heartbeat, and a tiny blue mask covered his eyes to protect them from the light. As I watched, he kicked one of his legs and gave a tiny, mewling cry. I felt like someone had stuck a dagger in my heart. We stood there, staring down at him, for what felt like a long time. Neonatal units should never be left unattended. It could only be a matter of minutes before someone would return. But I simply couldn't move, except every few seconds to look up and glance across towards the baby girl. I wondered if they too had spent the day in the basement with Andy Dunn and three sedated women. Or maybe the people in charge had taken the risk of leaving them where they were, gambling that Helen and her team wouldn't insist upon a closer look around a sterile neonatal unit, and that even if they did, they wouldn't recognise the significance of what they were seeing. I knew now where Stephen Gare had been getting his babies from. I knew why Helen had been able to find no paper trail of the babies that had been adopted overseas. George Reynolds, 
the head of social services, had protested his innocence, claiming that he and his team had been involved in no overseas adoptions, had given no approval, prepared no papers. He could well have been telling the truth. The babies Duncan and I were looking at would need no formal approval, no paperwork to be adopted overseas, because, officially and legally, these babies did not exist. Their gestation had been terminated prematurely, sometime between twenty-six and twenty-eight weeks. They were aborted fetuses that were still alive. Chapter 37 In recent years, enormous progress has been made in the care of babies born extremely prematurely. Not so very long ago, a baby born at twenty-four weeks would have been expected to die within minutes of birth, or, if it survived at all, to be severely handicapped. Now, such a child has a good chance of survival, and babies born at this stage of development have been known to grow into normal and healthy children. Yet, twenty-four weak fetuses are still routinely aborted. Every day that a fetus remains inside its mother's uterus, it is growing stronger and more viable. At twenty-six weeks, the possibility of its survival are considerably better than at twenty-four. By twenty-eight weeks, its chances are getting quite good. The next day, Emma's twenty-eight-week fetus would be delivered and rushed into one of these incubators. Emma would go back to her stage career relieved and thankful, believing a termination had taken place. The infant would remain here, receiving a high level of care for several months. If its brains, lungs and other essential organs remained healthy and normal, it would, no doubt, command a high price at an internet auction. Emma's termination had been delayed by five days. I guess that was standard practice with all the women who came here seeking late terminations. It would allow a little more time for the fetus to grow and develop. It would also enable the team to administer steroid drugs to encourage fetal lung development. Twenty-four hours ago, I'd have said it was the most vile thing I'd ever heard of. Now, knowing what these guys had planned for Dana and the others, what they'd done to so many women already, I couldn't say I was exactly surprised. I turned to Duncan. How long have you known? His eyes held mine steadily, without so much as a flicker. About this? The premature babies? Only a few weeks. And the rest? Since I was sixteen, he said. We get told on our sixteenth birthdays. He swept his hand up through his hair. But I didn't believe it, Tora. He stopped, looked away, then back again, or maybe I just told myself I didn't believe it. That's why I left Shetland. I went away to university, and not once in all those years did I ever come back, not even for a weekend. I've never set foot on this island before tonight, I swear. Duncan was a good liar. I'd learned that in the last few days, but somehow I didn't think he was lying now. But we did come back. You wanted to come back. Why? I did not want to come back, he spat at me. They threatened to kill you if I didn't come back, to kill any child you and I had. I had to take those fucking pills. If I'd got you pregnant, they'd have cut. He couldn't finish. But he didn't have to. Cut out my heart, I asked. He nodded. I could see the bones beneath his face, the huge purple shadows under his eyes. For the first time, I understood what Duncan had been going through during the past few months, what he'd had to deal with for most of his life. Your mother didn't have MS? My mother was perfectly healthy, until they got their hands on her. I reached out for his hand, afraid at how cold it was. What the hell are we going to do? 
He glanced round at the door, as though even now someone could be watching us. You are going to get back on your boat, just as I told you. You too. Come with me. For a second, I thought he was going to agree. Then he shook his head. If I come with you, those women are going to die. As soon as we raise the alarm, Richard will drop them all over the side. He'll claim he was out on an all-night fishing trip. And who's going to prove otherwise? We will. We've seen everything. I'm not proud to admit it, but I think I was too scared at that moment to really care about Dana and the other two women. All I wanted was Duncan and me off the island. Tor, you have no idea what we are dealing with. These people have influence you can't imagine. Even if we're allowed to live, no one will believe us. We need Dana and the others alive. He was right, of course. What are you going to do? I'm going down to the harbour to get on that boat. Richard is taking it out alone. I can deal with him. I'll wait until we're out at sea and whack him on the back of the head. Then I'll drive the boat back to Ewe Sound. With a bit of luck, your friend Helen will be there to meet me. I love you so much, I said. Somehow he managed to smile. Then he pulled me across the room and threw a door at the far end. The room beyond lay in shadow. We slipped inside and closed the door behind us. We were in a nursery. Six white-painted wooden cots stood around the edges of the room. Cartoon characters had been painted onto the whitewashed walls. Mobile swayed gently as they hung from the ceiling. Soft toys... Overstuffed teddy bears and floppy-eared rabbits stared down at us from shelves. There were changing tables, sterilizing equipment, a baby bath. It was all so creepily, terrifyingly normal. The cots, unnecessary for the time being, were all stripped bare to their mattresses. As I stared at them, so much fell into place. Since hearing about Tronal, I'd been puzzling how a maternity clinic could exist, given how few babies were supposedly born here each year. Now I knew the officially recorded babies were merely the cover for the island's more sinister activities. The clinic had been built to facilitate the births of the Trow's own baby sons. The rooms upstairs would house the abducted women, often drugged or restrained, during the whole of their pregnancies. When containment wasn't necessary, when no outsiders were on the island, the women might even be allowed a certain level of freedom, because Tronal was as impenetrable a prison as any I could imagine. How many pregnant women would risk swimming half a mile of rough ocean? Of course, if they knew that shortly after giving birth... They'd have weird Nordic symbols hacked into their flesh, that their hearts would be cut from their living bodies. I imagine one or two might just risk it. The six or so babies born from these women would be adopted by trial men and their wives, previously discouraged, as Duncan and I had been, from having children of their own. To legalise these babies their adoptive mother would be registered as their birth mother and would appear as such on their birth certificate. Did that mean these adoptive mothers, the men's wives, were colluding in what was going on? Did Elspeth know the truth about Duncan's birth? Not a question I really wanted to dwell on. Duncan and I ran across the room towards a door at the far end and stood listening. Nothing. We opened the door and went into a storeroom. More wooden cots had been dismantled and were propped against a wall. Folded buggies leaned against one another. Two other doors, one opened onto the corridor, the other led outside. Duncan crossed to the external door and pushed it open. A rush of cold air came in as he leaned out and looked all around. From somewhere in the clinic... I could hear voices, but none of them seemed close. 
but the trows only made babies in every third year. The babies offered legally for adoption were few and far between. The rest of the time, the facilities on Tronal would sit empty and unused. So the enterprising trows had come up with yet another use for the clinic, a facility for illegal late abortions. Finding desperate women through a network of hospitals, family planning centres and abortion clinics around Europe, and dressing up the service as counselling and advice, they'd probably found plenty of women happy to pay over the odds for their operations. A few days on the island, and these women would resume their normal lives, oblivious to what they'd really left behind on Trono. They'd never know that their own flesh and blood was still alive, growing and developing in the clinic's intensive care unit until well enough to be sold to the highest bidder. It was brilliant. Monstrous, but brilliant. Duncan came back into the room. OK, the dogs are locked up, and most of the staff here will be moving the women down to the boat. But you still have to be careful. Go as fast as you can, and don't be seen. I've never performed a parachute jump, but I imagine the moment of standing at the open plane door, waiting to jump, must feel exactly as I did then. I knew I had to go, leave Duncan, and make my way across the island alone, but couldn't quite bring myself to do it that second. Then Duncan pushed me, not remotely gently, out of the clinic, and I ran. Stopping for just a second to get my bearings, I made for the ridge of rock that would shelter me from anyone searching the immediate grounds. I reached it and dropped low, giving myself a second to get my breath back and make sure I hadn't been spotted. Looking back at the clinic, I saw the door had been closed. There was no sign of Duncan. When I had enough courage, I set off again, retracing my footsteps. I found the rucksack I'd left earlier and pulled on my waterproofs, then followed the cliff path until I reached the marker stone I'd left on the wall. I climbed over, squeezed through the gap in the barbed wire and ran to the cliff top. I was about to start the scramble down when I stopped. Something was moving on the beach. It was the cliff birds. They'd scared the hell out of me earlier. They were just doing it again, that's all. I had to get down there. Duncan was going to need help. Whatever it was, moved again. I froze. No bird could be that big. I crept down the cliff path. A loose rock went tumbling beneath me and I froze again. Below where I guessed the boat would be, a light flashed on. A beam of light started to creep around the rocks. I flattened myself against the cliff and kept as still as I could. At one point, the torch's beam touched my foot, but didn't linger, and after a minute or two, it was switched off. Slowly, carefully, I started to climb back up the cliff, praying I would disturb no more loose rocks. I reached the top and paused for breath. My boat had been discovered. They would be looking for me would search the island until they found me. I might manage to hold them off until dawn, but once daylight came, there'd be nowhere to hide. And they had dogs. If they set the dogs loose... One way or another, I was getting off that island. And there was only one other way I could think of. Richard was about to get another passenger. I set off again, running almost due north. Once I reached the track, I kept as close to it as I dared for the half mile or so that took me to the other side of the island. At one point I had to dive for cover when the sound of a diesel engine came roaring up from the harbour. It was a large four-wheel drive vehicle, similar to the one Dunn drove. It might even be his car. Several men were inside it. They were travelling at considerable speed, given how rough and potholed the road was. I ran on, getting more and more out of breath. I reached the highest ridge I had to cross, 
and began to stumble down the other side. The water of Skewder Sound was ahead of me, and tantalizingly close, the lights of Yui Sound. The motor launch was still moored to the pier. Its cabin lights were on, and from the bubble of water at its stern, I knew its engines were running. The wind was still pretty ferocious, masking any sounds that might be coming from the boat, but several of the dark clouds had blown away, allowing a small moon and a few stars to shine through. Visibility was better than when I'd arrived on the island, and I could make out the figures on my watch. 11.30 I ran down to the pier and crouched low by the side of the launch. It was fastened, port side too, by lines at the bow and the stern. I crept to the nearest cabin hatch and peered through. It was the main cabin. There was a helm, control panel and radio, a small teak-fitted living area with tiny galley, a chart table and three further doors leading off. No sign of Richard. I moved on and looked through the hatch of a small sleeping cabin. Dana lay on the bunk, motionless, but she wasn't alone in the cabin. I could see the tip of a polished black brogue and a few inches of charcoal grey trouser fabric. Thank God! Duncan was already on board! As gently as I could, I pulled myself up and swung my leg over the guardrail. The boat rocked only a fraction. Someone up there? called my father-in-law from below. Small boats aren't exactly blessed with hiding places. Frantically looking round, I could see only one way out, jumping over the side and swimming for Unst. Someone was moving below, climbing the steps. On the cabin roof was a folded awning, used to protect the cockpit from spray in poor weather conditions. I climbed up, lay down, and burrowed into its folds. The boat rocked as Richard climbed the companionway steps. I could see nothing, but knew Richard would be at the top of the steps, looking around, puzzled to see no one on board. He'd be less than two feet away from me. I held my breath, praying the canvas awning covered all of me, and that he wouldn't notice it looking bulkier than normal. Below, the boat's radio burst into crackling, static life. Arctic skewer, come in, Arctic skewer, base here. Richard climbed back down the steps. I prayed the wind would die down a little, just enough for me to hear what was going on. The radio crackled again. I thought I heard the word basement and a couple of expletives, but I couldn't be sure. Then... Richard spoke. Right, I understand. I'll be careful. I'm setting off now. Arctic skewer out. Below me, Richard was moving again. A cabin door opened and shut. Then I heard him heading up top. I counted seven footsteps, and then he was in the cockpit. He climbed heavily onto the seat and then the deck. I heard him walk forwards, and then the sliding sound of the bowline being released. At once the boat swung round, the current taking it away from the pier. Then Richard walked back down the deck towards the stern. I waited for him to stop, and then I risked peering out over the top of the canvas. He was bent almost double, his back to me, unfastening the stern line from the cleat. Once released... The boat would drift swiftly away from the pier, and he would have to rush back to the cabin to steer us away from Tronal. This was my best chance. Creep up behind him, give one almighty shove, and he'd go overboard. It would be the easiest thing in the world, then, for Duncan and me to drive the boat to Yui Sound. Too late. Richard began to turn. I crouched back down. The boat was drifting fast from the marina. Richard strode through the cockpit and down the steps. Then I heard the engines revving and the boat swung round to starboard. I looked up, trying to get my bearings. Nothing but blackness ahead. 
Behind me, the lights of Yui Sound were shrinking. We were heading east down the Skewder Sound, out into the North Sea. Richard wasn't sparing the engines. We sped along at seven or eight knots. Rhythmically, like hammers striking the seconds on a giant clock, waves thudded against the hull. The bow of the boat rose and dipped, and spray came hurtling over the deck like an intermittent and very cold shower. It was extremely uncomfortable, and I knew the longer I stayed where I was, the colder and stiffer I'd become. When was Duncan going to make his move? I got up. The cabin roof was slippery with seawater, and I gripped the rail before lowering myself onto the deck. The rucksack on my back was making me clumsy. I pulled it off and fastened it to a cleat. Then I reached inside. I found what I was looking for and tucked it into the front pocket of my waterproofs. Then Richard cut down the revs, and the boat slowed by several knots. We were heading south. Tronal was about two hundred yards away on the starboard side, and around us loomed huge, dark shapes, as menacing as they were unexpected. I'd never been this far east of the islands, and I didn't know that some of the oldest rocks in Shetland can be found exactly here. Stacks of granite, echoes of the majestic cliffs that towered here millions of years ago, were all around us. Some were massive, soaring above us in archways and monoliths, others crouched low in the water like fell beasts, waiting to pounce. They'd be beneath us, too, making navigation treacherous and explaining Richard's drop in speed. Like black cowled monks, frozen in prayer, they stood in silence and watched us passing. And something weird had got into my head that night, because it seemed to me these rocks were sentient, that the human drama taking place before them was hardly new, and that they watched, coldly curious, waiting to see how the act would be played out this time. After ten minutes or so, we left them behind, and Richard picked up speed again. Still no sign of Duncan, but we were travelling away from help. We had to move soon. I wondered if Duncan, down in the cabin, might not realise which direction we were going in. In any case, we couldn't wait much longer. I moved along the deck until I could step into the cockpit. Glancing down the companionway, I could see Richard at the helm, Chart at his elbow. If he turned, he would see me. I just had to hope he wouldn't. I raised the lid of the portside locker and looked inside. Several coils of rope. I chose the shortest and closed the lid. Then I moved across the cockpit to the steps. I wasn't going to hide again. When he turned, he would see me. So be it. I stepped into the companionway, put my foot on the top step. Richard didn't move. Holding the guardrail with my free hand, I lowered myself onto the next step down, then the next. The third step was damp, and my trainer slipped a fraction. It made a faint, squelching sound. Good evening, Tora, said Richard quietly. All the wind went out of me, and I sat down, hard on the steps. He turned, and we looked into each other's eyes. I'd expected anger, exasperation, maybe even a cruel sort of triumph. What I saw was sadness. We stared at each other for a long time. Then his eyes flickered over my shoulder to the portside cabin. Did he know already that Duncan was on board, too? I glanced to one side. The door was closed tight. I turned back to Richard. He pulled back the throttle, and the boat slowed almost to a halt. He reached over and switched on the autopilot. Then he stood and took a step towards me. I wish you hadn't, he said. I felt my eye sting and my jaw start to tremble. Please let me not be about to cry. Not now. I suppose Emma gave me away, I asked. 
praying that was the case. If Emma had told them, they might not know I'd met up with Duncan. Richard might not know he was on board. And where the hell was he anyway? I pressed my right hand against my chest, felt the reassuring hardness beneath my waterproofs. Yes, she mentioned your visit. And then it was a simple matter of checking video footage to confirm it was you. Not that any of us had any doubt. You've been very brave, my dear. I pushed myself up and jumped down into the cabin. Richard took a step back. Again his eyes flickered to the door behind me, but I wasn't about to be distracted. Okay, less of the my dears. You and I have never been close, nor are we likely to be in future, given where you're going. I think the GMC might have a few questions about the services you offer at that clinic of yours. That's when the police have finished with you. Richard stiffened. Please, don't presume to preach at me. Those babies would have died before birth, would have been murdered before birth without us. Because of us, they will have a good life, with parents who love and want them. I was close to speechless. It's totally illegal. The law is a complete mess, Tora. The law allows us to inject potassium chloride into an infant's heart right up until the moment of birth. Up to 24 weeks we can do it for no other reason than that the pregnancy is inconvenient to the mother. Yet if a child of 24 weeks is actually born, we have to do everything in our power to preserve its life. Where's the sense in any of that? We don't make the law. I said, knowing I was sounding lame. And we certainly don't exploit its weaknesses for commercial. Do you have any idea how many terminations go wrong every year when the babies come out alive, often severely handicapped? Richard came back at me angrily. Because I've come across several in my time. Babies whose mothers abandoned them even before birth. What kind of life are they going to have? Surely our way is better than that. You're trading in human beings, I almost hissed at him. We help women out of difficult situations. We provide childless couples with hope for the future. And we save dozens of babies who would otherwise be murdered for social expediency. We are preservers of life. I couldn't believe he was seriously trying to take the moral high ground. And Dana, are you planning on preserving her life? He seemed to shrink a little into himself. Sadly, no. That's out of my hands. I hear she was a fine young woman. I'm sorry she had to get involved. Then he pulled himself up again. Although, frankly, if anyone's responsible for Miss Tullock's death, it's you. If you hadn't been so determined to meddle in the police investigation, she'd never have learned enough to put her life in danger. Out of your hands, you sick shit. It's your hands that will be weighting her down and throwing her overboard. Richard shook his head, as though dealing with an unreasonable child. I began to wonder if he was mad. Or if I was. This is so typical of you, Tora. You can't reason your way out of an argument, so you resort to abuse. Is it any wonder we've never been close? Shut up. This is not family therapy time. I can't believe you're preaching to me about saving lives. You tried to kill me last Sunday. You sabotaged my boat and my life jacket. Actually, I knew nothing about that. Stop lying to me. You're about to kill me. The least you can do is tell me the truth. He isn't lying. I soared through the mast. I whipped round. Stephen Gare stood in the doorway of the port cabin. His face was crumpled, slightly red. My eyes dropped to his feet. Black brogues. Jesus, he said. What do you have to do to get some decent kip around here? 
Chapter 38 I dropped the rope and backed up out of Gare's reach and came up sharply against the chart table. Gare stepped to one side and leaned against the steps. No way out. You look like you've seen a ghost, Dora, he said, smiling sleepily. I took hold of the zip and the pocket of my waterproofs and started to inch it down. Don't tell me, I said. Reports of your death have been exaggerated. Where's Duncan? Duncan had a change of heart. He won't be joining us tonight. I risked taking my eyes off Gare to look at Richard. What have you done with Duncan? I demanded. Richard leaned over and fumbled on the shelf that ran around the cabin's interior. He straightened up again, and I thought I saw the wrapping of a hypodermic concealed in his large hand. And no one's about to kill you, said Gare, his arms stretching high above his head. At least, not any more, he continued when he'd done yawning. You're going back to Tronal. I stared at him, not sure what he meant. Then I got it. As a strong, cold hand took a grip on my heart, I got it. Not this time, I managed. I think one or two people might just notice I'm gone. Gare shook his head, seemingly unable to take the grin off his face. That boat you stole will be found drifting sometime in the next couple of days, he said. Some of your things will be discovered in the cabin, traces of your blood on the deck. People will assume you had an accident and went overboard. They'll look for your body, of course. Hold a very tasteful memorial service when they don't find it. I bit my tongue to keep from blurting out about the note I'd left for Helen. If they knew about that, they'd break into Dana's house before dawn and destroy it. Without the note, without Duncan, who would doubt that I'd taken out a boat in storm conditions for unfathomable reasons of my own? But I had been pretty disturbed of late, and hadn't made it back. Without the note, the bastards might just get away with it. I couldn't let them know about the note. If it's all the same to you, I said, glaring at Gare, I'd just as soon you drowned me now. Without my noticing, Richard had moved closer. She has a weapon, Stephen. Something tucked down the front of her suit. Gare glanced at Richard, then back at me. His eyes dropped to my stomach. I'll say she has. Sorry, love. You and your little friend are far too valuable. My right hand was ready to slip inside my waterproofs. What are you talking about? You're pregnant, Dora. Congratulations. His grin got even wider. He looked like a wolf. What? For a second, I was so amazed, I forgot to feel afraid. In the club, up the duff, bun in the oven. You're insane. Richard, is she pregnant? I risked a glance at Richard. I'm afraid you are, Tora, he said. I took a blood sample last Sunday while you were sedated. There were significant levels of HCG. I guess Duncan got careless with his medication. HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, is the hormone produced by the body of a pregnant woman. It is HCG that home testing kits are designed to detect but a blood test can pick it up a matter of days after conception. Gare was still smiling at me, but I could hardly see him. It didn't occur to me to doubt what they were saying. I'd felt like shit for days. Nausea and exhaustion are classic symptoms of early pregnancy, but I'd put them down to stress. I was pregnant. After two years of trying and failing, I was finally pregnant. I was carrying Duncan's child, and these guys, these monsters, thought they were going to take it away from me. How did you get into my office? 
I said, feeling a surge of hatred for Gare, as I remembered the drugs I'd unwittingly taken the night I'd discovered Melissa's identity. Drugs can do any amount of damage to a young fetus. I know how you got into the house. How did you get into my office? Even as I spoke, I realised how he'd done it. My office keys had gone missing. Gare had stolen them the night he left the strawberries and the pig's heart in our house. He was a petty thief as well as everything else. Pick up that rope and tie up Richard, I said, gesturing to the rope I'd dropped minutes before. Do it quickly and properly, and he won't get hurt. Gare looked back, and the emptiness in his eyes was perhaps the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. And why would I do that? he asked. I pulled my hand out from my pocket. Because a two-inch iron bolt ramming into your brain is going to hurt a bit. Gare glanced down, looking to my immense satisfaction, slightly less sure of himself. What the hell is that? My grandfather's humane horse killer. Except you're not going to think it very humane when it's pressed up against your temple. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Richard drop his head into his hands, rub his face, and then straighten up. As a gesture, it was so completely Ken, I wondered why I hadn't guessed immediately the two of them were father and son. Tora, please put that down, Richard said. Someone's going to get hurt. You are so right, I said, and it isn't going to be me. Gare moved towards me. I jerked my hand up. He danced back and came at me the other way. I jabbed the weapon at him, and he jumped back again. He moved left, then right, fainting attacks, always diving back at the last second. He was taunting me, trying to unnerve me, and it was working. He was also gradually moving round the cabin, away from the steps, and closer to me, forcing me to turn my back on Richard. I spun, jumping round and away from him, to Richard's other side. Richard reached for me, and I ducked. Then I grabbed Richard by the neck of his pullover and pushed the gun up against the side of his face. If I pulled the trigger now, I would miss his brain, but still make a hell of a mess. Don't move. Don't move a fucking inch, either of you. Gare froze. He held his hands in the air and stood poised, ready to leap, eyes glinting with excitement. Tora! gasped Richard. Others are coming. They'll be here any second. Good, I spat, although I was still thinking coherently enough to know the news was anything but good. There are one or two things I'd like to say to Andy Dunn, not to mention my favourite boss. Gare frowned. Richard twitched his head in my direction. Do you mean Ken? he asked. Richard, can we just... Ken isn't coming, said Richard. I released the pressure I'd been applying to Richard's face, allowing him to turn his head and face me. Gare tensed as if ready to spring. Don't try it, Stephen. I can pull this trigger before you get here. I hadn't taken my eyes off Richard. What do you mean? I asked. Richard's eyes narrowed, as though searching for something in my face. For a moment or two he said nothing, and I held my breath. Then, Ken isn't one of us, he said softly, as though breaking bad news. I can see why you might think so. He certainly looks the part, but he isn't. How come, I demanded, unwilling to let myself believe something that logic told me couldn't possibly be true. How come? Come Duncan is, was, but Ken isn't. Richard, do we really have time for this crap? I loved his mother, said Richard. When it came to it, I couldn't hurt her. I helped her escape. She's lived in New Zealand for the past forty years. Ken knows nothing about this? Richard shook his head. He knows his mother, I helped them make contact a few years ago, but no, he's not one of us. 
It's a great shame in many ways. He is an exceptional man, very gifted. What he would have achieved if... Well, it doesn't do to dwell on these things. My fault, of course. I let myself get involved. It won't happen again. I could see Gare making impatient movements. You were never intended to be part of this, you know, continued Richard. Elspeth and I are fond of you. We know Duncan loves you. His eyes left me, and his gaze seemed to turn inwards. I wondered if he was remembering Ken's mother. The year from now, you could have adopted a newborn baby. It could even have been Duncan's baby. You weren't supposed to be harmed. Unlike the poor child's mother, of course. Did I meet her tonight? Which one was it to be? Odell or Freya? This is getting us nowhere. I wish you'd put that thing down, said Gare, taking a step forward, and I wish you'd slit your wrists and jump over the side. A sudden movement, a noise, that none of us had made. Richard and I both turned as one to the port cabin. Gare leaped at us. Too late, I swung the gun up, just as his full weight came crashing down on me. I pulled the trigger, felt the bolt connect, and then the gun was knocked from my hand as we both fell. For a second I lay stunned on the cabin floor. Gare lay over me, pinning me down. Be careful with her, for heaven's sake, said Richard. We don't want to lose that baby. Richard, will you take care of the boat? God knows where we are right now. I heard Richard move. Then the revs of the boat increased, and we turned sharply to port. I heard the crackle of the ship's radio and him speaking into it, trying to make contact with another boat. Gare was wearing a crumpled grey business suit, no doubt the same one he'd been wearing when he'd been arrested, questioned, and charged with murder. He probably hadn't been allowed to change before spending the night in the cell. He'd have been wearing it that morning when he'd swallowed the sedatives that reduced his peripheral pulse, when he'd pretended to hang himself and had been carted off, not to the morgue, of course, but to Tronal. A dark stain on his right shoulder was spreading slowly, but if he felt any pain, he wasn't showing it. I think a thousand different ways of pleading with him came into my head that moment. I was all out of bravado. I didn't want to fight any more. I just wanted to live a bit longer. I think I even got as far as opening my mouth, forming the first words, but I never got the chance to utter them. Because Gare's eyes left mine and searched along the cabin floor until he spotted the gun. His weight shifted as he raised himself up and reached out. Then he leaned back over me, pushed the humane killer against my left thigh and looked into my eyes. He smiled as he pulled the trigger, and my world exploded in a mass of white-hot pain. Chapter 39 I couldn't see, couldn't hear, couldn't breathe. The boat swerved again. The hell are you doing? I heard Richard calling out from some great distance away. She'll bleed to death before we can get her back. Then fix it, Doctor. I'll drive the boat. Marginally, the pain was receding, leaving my head, my chest, my abdomen, and concentrating in one spot, the fleshy part of my upper thigh. The blackness in my head faded a little, and I could see again. And hear again. A terrifying noise filled the cabin, and I realised it was me, screaming. Richard pushed his hands under my shoulders and dragged me across the floor into the starboard cabin. With a strength I'd never have believed he possessed, he picked me up and lay me on the bunk beside the still form of a woman. Freya. Even through the pain I recognised her. Then he took hold of both my hands and pressed them against the wound. Push hard, he instructed, 
Stem the bleeding. You know what will happen if you don't. Only too well. Crimson fluid was pumping from my leg. Gare had most likely hit an artery, and I was in big trouble. I pressed hard, but I could feel the strength draining from me. I felt like I do when I'm falling asleep, when keeping the mind focused on even the simplest thing becomes impossible. Except I could not sleep. I had to stay conscious. I could hear Gare on the radio and the crackle of someone responding to him. Richard was back. He pushed my hands away and started wrapping something around my leg. He pulled tight, then tighter. I looked down. The white of the bandages was already soaked scarlet. I can never see fresh blood without admiring it. Such an amazing substance, rich and strong and vibrant. Such a beautiful colour. So sad to see it leaking away, dripping down through the floorboards, into the bilges and out, to disappear without trace amidst the cold salt waters of the North Sea. Gare was giving the coordinates of our position. Reinforcements were on their way. I had lost. I was going back to Tronal to spend the next eight months chained and drugged while a new life grew inside me. A life I had planned for, longed for, prayed for. And now that it was here, it was to be my death. I wondered what they'd do with Duncan, whether he would be allowed to live, be given one last chance to come back to the fold, or whether he was already dead. Richard twisted me so that my head rested on Freya's shoulder and then propped my left leg against the wall, allowing gravity to do its job. Then he leaned forward, put his hands on my shoulders and looked into my eyes. The room seemed to darken around him. Relax now, he said. The pain will go. I struggled hard and forced my eyes shut. You're hypnotizing me? No. He stroked my forehead, and my eyes opened. Just calming you, helping you with the pain. He continued stroking my forehead, and remarkably, the pain did seem to ease. But with it went what was left of my focus. I was starting to drift, didn't want that to happen. I reached out and caught his hand. Why? I managed. Why do you kill us? Why do you hate your mother so much? He held my hand in both of his. We have no choice, he said. It's what makes us who we are. He leaned closer. But never think we hate the women who bear our children. We don't. We mourn our mothers, honour their memories, miss them all our lives. We are not a religious people, but if we were, our mothers would be our saints. They made the ultimate sacrifice for their sons. Their lives, I whispered. Their hearts, he said. I tore my eyes away from his, back to the poppy-stained bandages around my leg, and knew what he was about to tell me. Oh, God, please, God, no. Richard sat down on the bunk beside me. He was still holding my hand. When I was nine days old, he said, I drank the blood of my mother's heart. He paused giving me a moment to understand what he was saying. I couldn't speak. I could only stare at him. It was given to me in a bottle, along with the last of her milk. Bile rose in my throat. Stop! I don't want... He hushed me, stroking a finger gently across my cheek. I swallowed hard, concentrated on taking deep breaths. Of course, I knew nothing about it at the time. It was much later, on my sixteenth birthday, that I learned of, shall we say, 
my extraordinary heritage. Breathe in, breathe out. It was all I could think of. I heard his words, but I don't think I was really registering them. Not then, not till much later. You can imagine the shock. I'd grown up with my father and his wife, a woman I loved very much. I had no idea she wasn't my biological parent. And the horror of what they were telling me, of what had been done to the woman who... I think it was just about the darkest day of my life. A derisory phrase sprang into my head, was on the tip of my tongue. My heart bleeds, I nearly said. Jesus, who on earth came up with that one? But at the same time, it was the start of my life, of understanding who I really was. I already knew I was special, brighter by far than any other child in the class. I was a gifted musician, and I could speak four languages, two of which I taught myself. I was stronger, faster, and more able in just about everything I did. Every sport I attempted, I mastered, and I was never ill. Not once in all my sixteen years had I ever had a day off school because of sickness. When I was twelve, I broke my ankle playing soccer. It healed in two weeks. I found my voice. You were just lucky. A fortunate combination of genes. It had nothing to do with... And I had other powers, too, stranger powers. I discovered... I could make people do what I wanted, just by suggestion. Hypnosis. Yes, that's what some of the younger ones like to call it. I shook my head. I wasn't buying it, but I couldn't find words to argue. I was introduced to two other boys who'd already turned sixteen. One was from the main island, the other from Bresse. They were just like me, just as strong, just as clever. I was told about four others a few months younger who were the rest of my peer group, and I met six older boys who had just turned nineteen. They knew what we were going through, had been through it themselves, three years previously. Every three years, I said. He nodded. Every three years, between five and eight boys are born. We have just one son in our lifetimes, one son who will become one of us. Trous. I wanted to scoff, tried to scoff, but it was hard. He frowned. Kunal Trous, he corrected. Then he relaxed, even half smiled. So many stories, so much nonsense, little grey men who live in caves and fear iron. Yet, tucked away inside all legends, a kernel of truth can be found. All those women, all those deaths, how do you do it? He smiled again. I think he was even starting to show off. The practicalities are remarkably simple. The key is having people in the right places. Once a woman has been identified, we watch her very closely. We may stage an accident, or her GP might discover an illness. Uh, not all GPs on the islands are with us, of course, so it depends. Once she's in hospital, it becomes very straightforward, although, obviously, every case has to be handled differently. Typically, a high dosage of something like midazolam is given to slow the metabolism right down, so the life support machines automatically sound the alarm. If relatives are present, the medical team make a great show of trying to save the patient, but fail. The unconscious woman is taken to the morgue, where our people are on standby to take her to Tronal. The pathologist produces a report and a weighted coffin is either buried or incinerated. Naturally, we encourage cremation. Naturally. What about Melissa? He sighed. Melissa was a special case, 
like you, never intended to be part of all this. He glanced towards the open door of the cabin, glaring in Gare's direction. We do not use our own wives. She found out. He nodded. She learned Stephen's passwords and went through his computer files one night. He stretched out a hand, stroked my forehead again. Melissa was a very clever, very stubborn woman, he continued. She was like you in so many ways. It struck me as the deepest irony that you should be the one to find her. Her mistake, of course, was in confronting Stephen, telling him what she knew. We had to act fast. At first, we planned to eliminate her, but she told Stephen she was pregnant and he didn't want to lose the child. It was his idea to substitute the other woman, the one from Oban. I was against it. Too many complications. But we'd pretty much run out of time. And Kirsten Hoyk? I know she's in my field, too. Did you stage that accident? Did one of you drive the lorry? He shook his head. No, Kirsten's accident was genuine. We just exaggerated the extent of her injuries. She had a son. He lives on Yell now, a fine boy. Kirsten might have recovered. The almost unbearable grief I'd seen Joss Hoyk enduring could have been totally unnecessary. I wanted to scream, but knew that if I did, I wouldn't be able to stop. Why do you bury the women? Why not just dump them at sea? Or burn them? If you'd done that, I'd never have found Melissa. No, but we can't. It's against our beliefs. Our mothers lie in what is for us sacred ground. It's part of the way we honour them. And I suppose it was just too great a risk to bury them all on Tronal. So you've created burial grounds all over the islands? He inclined his head, acknowledging the truth of what I was saying. And Duncan? Duncan did this too? Drank? Richard nodded. He did. So did his father, and his grandfather before him, and my father, and grandfather, and great-grandfather. We are the Kunal Trows, stronger and more powerful than any other men on earth. He stood up, ready to return to the main cabin. I was so tired. I wanted nothing more than to slip into unconsciousness. And I knew that if I did so, I would die. I had to keep talking. How many? How many of you are there? He paused at the door. Around the world, between four and five hundred. Most live here, but about a hundred years ago, we started to colonize. We prefer islands, remote, but with a strong local economy. My body was trembling, and I felt a strong urge to vomit. I was going into shock, but I was no longer in danger of losing consciousness. The pain was hell, but I could deal with it. You're not special, I said. It's all in your head. Richard's voice had fallen as though he was trying to comfort a distressed child. You have no idea of the powers we have, influence you couldn't even dream of. These islands and many others around the world belong to us. We do not flaunt our wealth, but we possess it in immeasurable terms. You're just ordinary men. I'm eighty-five years old, Tora, and yet I have the strength of a man in his fifties. How ordinary is that? Richard, called Gare, I think I can hear an engine. I need to go up top and signal. Can you take the helm? Richard started to turn. Believe me, if you can, my dear. It will make the next few months easier. He turned and left the cabin, closing the door and shutting me inside with a motionless frayer. I felt a moment of surprise that he hadn't sedated me. Maybe all that showing off about his so-called special powers had made him forget. Or more likely, 
he figured the pain and blood loss would be enough to keep me immobile. I looked up at my leg. Blood was no longer pumping out, and it was possible the artery wasn't severed after all. I risked lowering it, and then raised myself up so that I was sitting on the bunk. The bleeding increased, but not alarmingly. I looked at Freya. Still breathing, possibly not as heavily as before, but otherwise no real signs of life. I could expect no help from that quarter. I sat on the bunk, thinking. It would be just about impossible to get the better of Richard and Gare, injured as I was, but I had to try. While they were separated, Gare on deck, Richard driving the boat and with his back to me, I had the best chance. Once the other boat arrived, Dana would go overboard and I'd be guarded, possibly drugged, until the police operation was over and I was safely back on Tronal. I tried standing up. A stab of pain shot up through my leg. I took deep breaths, counted to ten, waited for the pain to subside, then I stepped forward. Another stab of pain. Not so bad this time. Clinging to the shelf around the cabin, I inched forwards until I reached the door handle. Motor launches have terrifically loud engines, but Richard had reduced the speed, and I thought I caught the sound of another engine somewhere in the distance. I turned the handle and pulled at the door. It opened silently. Richard was alone in the main cabin standing at the wheel, peering forwards as though struggling to see ahead. We'd reached another offshore mass of stacks, and the navigation was tricky. If I knocked him out, which was basically the plan, we could easily hit one of the huge granite rocks around us. Once the hull was breached, the launch would sink quickly, and I'd have to launch a life raft, always assuming there was one on board, get three unconscious women onto it, and deal with a strong and violent psychopath. All this with only one good leg. Like I said, I didn't fancy my odds. On the other hand, I really didn't like what was on the other hand. I needed a weapon. Grandad's horse gun lay on a shelf at the far side of the cabin, but I'd never be able to reach it without Richard seeing me. I looked all around. The floor was still slick with blood, my blood, and my stomach churned. I forced myself to look away. I checked the shelves that ran around the cabin and found where the boat tools were kept. I slipped my hand down. It was like a life-or-death game of jack straws. Dislodge one from the heap without moving the others or making a sound. Amazingly, I managed it. I raised my hand and examined my find. Some sort of pliers, thick steel about twelve inches long. They would do. No point hanging about. I limped forwards, arm above my head. Of course, Richard saw my reflection in the cabin windows. He spun round, catching my arm, pushing it down behind my back. With my free hand, I pushed at his chest, then in desperation clawed at his eyes. He hit me just once, a heavy blow across the temples. Blood shot from my mouth and flew across the cabin as my legs gave way under me. I grabbed the lapel of Richard's jacket and clung on. As I toppled, I took him with me. We landed heavily, he on top of me. He pushed himself up. For a second I could only stare at him, wait for him to act. Then I grabbed his earlobe and he yelled with pain. He hit my arm hard and I had to let go, but with my other hand I went for his eyes again. He sat up, straddled across me, pinning me down. With one hand he grabbed my right wrist and held fast. With the other he reached for my throat. Knowing it could be the last sound I ever made, I screamed. Richard's hand wrapped around my neck and squeezed. I thrashed my head from side to side, but his grip wasn't budging. He was incredibly strong. I'd been a fool to imagine I could overpower him. With my left hand, I struck out at his face, 
but his arms were longer than mine and I couldn't reach him. I tore at the hand, holding my throat, dug my nails into skin, tried to wrench it away. The instinctive panic that goes hand in hand with oxygen deprivation had set in, giving me strength I wouldn't otherwise have had, but it still wasn't enough. Richard was no longer looking at me, but at a point over my head. He wasn't capable of looking me in the eyes as he throttled me. I think I took a small measure of comfort from that as the darkness began to grow. Then he convulsed, just once, and his grip relaxed, releasing the pressure on my throat. My lungs started pumping, desperate for air, but my throat had been damaged by the pressure of Richard's strong hand. Like a dented pipe, it couldn't let enough air flow through, and the darkness in my head continued to grow. Richard fell forwards towards me. His eyes met mine but were expressionless. His weight shifted. My lungs made a gigantic effort, and air flooded in once more. I managed to raise both hands to fend him off, and as he collapsed, I shoved hard. He rolled to one side, and I pushed against him, without a clue what was happening, but grasping at any chance to be free. He fell face down on the floor of the cabin. A circle of blackness stained the thick white hair on the back of his head, and as I watched, a small bubble of blood rose from the wound and burst as it reached the air. Tearing my eyes away, I looked at the figure kneeling above him. Eyes met mine, and I thought I saw a brief glimmer of recognition before they glazed over. There was a heavy thud as the humane killer, the thick iron bolt stained dark with Richard's blood, fell to the floor. Pushing myself up, I reached over and felt for a pulse in Richard's neck. There was nothing. I pulled myself to my feet, stepped over him, and peered up the companionway steps. Gare was nowhere in sight, but I could make out flickers of light as he signalled to another boat. I bent down, picked up the weapon, and reloaded the boat. Then at last, I reached out and touched the face of Richard's killer. Eyes dazed with drugs looked back emptily into mine. Then I saw a gleam of intelligence and Dana's lips stretched into a smile. Can you understand me? I whispered, feeling myself smile in response. She nodded, but didn't seem able to speak. Stephen Gare is up there, I said, gesturing towards the cockpit. He is very dangerous. No surprise in her eyes. Can you watch the steps? When he appears, let me know. She nodded again, and I stood up and limped over to the helm. I could see no immediate hazards ahead. The depth gauge was unable to read the depth, always a reassuring sign, and I flicked the boat onto autopilot. Then I picked up the radio and switched to channel 16. Mayday, 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 I said as loudly as I dared, knowing Gare would hear the crackle of the response and hoping you would think it was the other boat talking to Richard. Mayday, 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 I repeated. This is motor launch, Arctic skewer, Arctic skewer. We are in Shetland waters, travelling south down the eastern coast of Tronal Island. We require urgent medical and police assistance. There was a crackle of static. No response. I glanced round. Dana's eyes hadn't left the companionway steps. I could hear footsteps above us. There are six people on board, I said into the mouthpiece. Two of us are injured. Three have been drugged. Only one is able-bodied, and he is a danger to the rest of us. We need help urgently. Repeat, urgently. Another crackle. Still no response. It was close to hopeless. Even if anyone were listening which the Shetland Coast Guard at least certainly should be. They would never get to us in time. 
The second tronal boat would be here any second, and the other women and I were going overboard. All I could do was make sure we didn't disappear without a trace. We are Tora Hamilton, Richard Guthrie, Stephen Gare, and Dana Tullach. Repeat, Dana Tullach, who is alive and well. Not for much longer, though. I could definitely hear another engine getting closer. Also, two other women whose real names I don't know. We have been abducted and held prisoner by Richard Guthrie and Stephen Gare. Both men are extremely dangerous. That was stretching it a bit. Richard hadn't moved and looked anything but dangerous. Gare was another matter. If he came below, he would kill me. He would have no choice. Without Richard, he would be unable to administer the drugs that would keep me insensible until we got back to Tronal. The baby would have to be sacrificed. He would kill me and throw me overboard. Dana, too. The other two women might survive the trip, but for what? Another eight months of imprisonment and a violent death. I could not let Gare come below. I had to go up and tackle him head on. Except I couldn't do it. I was weak from loss of blood and dizzy from pain. I spent most of the night running on adrenaline and the tank was empty. I couldn't fight him, couldn't even climb the steps. I would wait, hide inside one of the sleeping cabins, jump on him when he came back down. It was the only possible way. A noise above. Someone had leaped on the roof of the cabin. Hey, ladies! Gare's face hung upside down in the companionway. He was lying on the cabin roof, staring down at us. Veins bulged on his forehead, and I could see his large white teeth. I realised that he and Sanity had parted company. His eyes darted to Richard's body and narrowed. Then he looked back at me. Get up here, Tora, he said. Chapter 40 Unable to tear my eyes from Gare's face, I shook my head. I wasn't going anywhere near him. He terrified me. His head disappeared. I heard him striding along the roof, and I stepped closer to Dana. She reached out and held my ankle as I gripped the gun tight. Then Gare's face appeared again. I'm opening the sea cocks, Tora, he sneered. You'll have about ten minutes before the boat sinks like a stone. If you want to save your three friends, you come up top now. He strode off towards the bow of the boat. I staggered to the companionway and pulled myself up the steps. Gare was bent over the anchor locker. He saw me, straightened up and moved towards me. I stood my ground. He was wounded too, although not as badly as I, and I still had the gun. I wasn't giving in just yet. He climbed onto the cabin roof and stood there, legs apart for balance, towering above me. The wind whipped his clothes against him, showing the lean, strong lines of his body. His face gleamed white against the night sky, and his teeth were bared in a hideous attempt at a smile. He no longer looked like a wolf. He looked like a demon. I backed away until I came up against the cockpit steering wheel. The contents of my bowels turned to mush, and the muscles were no longer able to hold them in place. Evil-smelling warmth started to pour down my legs, legs that had turned to straw and would hold me no longer. I sank to the cockpit floor. Gare held something in one hand, a short length of chain. He swung it round and it crashed against the cabin roof. Then he caught hold of the other end with his left hand and pulled it tight. It was about three feet long, and the links must have been a quarter of an inch thick. He stood at the edge of the cabin roof, poised to leap down. The boat rocked, and he steadied himself. Below I thought I could hear Dana's voice repeating the mayday call I'd given earlier. I thought I heard a faint crackle of response. It was too late, though. Too late for me, at any rate. 
Just off the port bow loomed a massive shape, for a split second almost as terrifying as the man about to leap at me. Another granite stack, dangerously close. I dropped the gun and reached my right hand back through the spokes of the steering wheel, stretching up and back towards the centre of the wheel where I knew the instruments must be. My fingers felt buttons and I began pressing. The buttons beeped at me in response. I had no idea what they were, I just had to hope. Gare raised himself on tiptoe. I reached high again, grabbed a spoke at the top of the wheel and pulled down as hard as I could. The boat responded. One of the buttons I'd pressed had disengaged the autopilot and I was in control of the helm. Travelling at speed, the launch almost tipped over under the force of the abrupt turn. Below, objects rolled across the cabin floor and I heard Dana cry out. Gare staggered, almost slipped, grasped for something to steady himself and then miraculously regained his balance just as we hit the twenty-foot-high granite stack. As the boat swerved, I'd fallen to the floor of the cockpit. The force of the impact threw me back against the wheel, jarring my shoulders and nearly knocking me out. Through eyes that could barely see, I watched Stephen Gare fly towards me. His eyes held mine, and in that split second I saw fury, then fear, as he sailed through the air and crashed hard against the steering wheel. I heard a crack that I knew must be bone breaking and made myself turn to face him as he collapsed over the wheel. Then the freewheeling motion of the boat sent him over again to land slumped in the stern of the boat. I took hold of the wheel and dragged myself up. I pulled myself around it, close to Gare. He was starting to move, to lift his head up from the deck. Bracing myself against the wheel, I kicked out. My foot connected, and he slid backwards. His hand shot out and grabbed my ankle. I held the wheel with both hands, lifted my other foot, and jumped on his wrist. He let go, and I kicked again. He slid further back, and I kicked him again, this time connecting with his face. Sickened that I was capable of such violence but unable to stop, I pushed one last time with both feet. I fell down into the stern as he slid overboard. I don't know how long I knelt there staring down at the wash. I think I even considered rolling overboard myself. Realistically, it could only have been a few seconds before I realised the boat was spinning out of control. I crawled back into the cockpit and reached for the button that would switch the engines off. The engines died and their sound faded into the night. The boat was still moving with the wind and the tide, but no longer careering around madly. And that was it. Absolutely it. Nothing more I could do. I collapsed down, leaning against the steering wheel, wondering where help might come from, whether there was any real possibility of it doing so. Then Dana's face appeared in the companionway. She saw me, but still didn't seem able to speak. Then she disappeared, and I wondered if she'd fallen. I wanted to go and help her. I think I even tried to stand up, but I couldn't do it. I wanted to cry, too but I didn't even have the energy for that. Then something appeared over the top of the companionway steps, a tangle of canvas straps and metal. It was a life jacket. They'd been stored on one of the shelves around the main cabin. I watched, and another appeared. Then a third. Tora, come on. Get one of these things on yourself. I could barely hear Dana's voice, so feeble did it sound against the wind. Reaching up, I took hold of the wheel and managed to pull myself up onto all fours. I crawled round the wheel and across the cockpit floor. My leg was throbbing again, and I tried not to think about it, to concentrate only on getting to the steps. A hand appeared, a woman's arm. 
I reached out and grabbed it. I had no strength, but I held on as I fell backwards, and a woman collapsed over the top of the steps. Her dark hair fell forward, covering her face. I pulled again and heard Dana grunt as she pushed from below. The dark-haired woman came up over the steps and landed on top of me. I pushed her to one side. It was Freya, the younger of the two. Her eyes opened briefly. She stared at me, then closed them again and sank back against the cockpit seat. I heard Dana's voice calling, Tora! Saw a movement at the steps, more hands on the rails. Odell was climbing up by herself. She looked weak, barely able to focus, and I guessed Dana was pushing her up. I reached out for her hand as she staggered up over the steps and into the cockpit. She gasped at the cold and almost fell against me. Somehow, I managed to stand up and stumble to the steps. I reached out and took hold of Dana's arm. She came up surprisingly easily, and I helped her climb over the last step. As the wind hit her, she started shivering violently. Below, I could see the cabin floor was underwater, and it was rising fast. Gare had said we would have ten minutes once water started to flood the boat. Dana's eyes met mine. Life jackets, I gasped, looking at Freya and Odell. Dana, sensible, practical Dana, was already wearing hers. She nodded and passed one to me. I managed to pull it over my head and fasten the metal buckle. Dana helped me pull jackets over the other two, and then I inflated all of them and switched on the small lights that would give anyone searching for us just the ghost of a chance. Water was breaking over the stern now, and all four of us were sitting in an icy pool. Spray was soaking us, filling the cockpit every few seconds, hastening our descent. There was no time for the life raft, even if I could find it. I grabbed four harnesses and clipped our life jackets together at the waist. Sink or swim, we were doing it together. Can you stand up? I yelled at Dana. I think so, she managed, and together we struggled to our feet. Odell was able to stand with us, and between us, we supported Freya. Her eyes were darkening. She was sinking again. I climbed onto the seat, and then the side deck. Dana followed, then Odell, and we dragged up Freya. Stumbling, grasping at anything that looked firm, we made our way to the stern of the rocking boat until we were all standing, looking down at the motionless propeller. I unclipped the rail and held tight to one of the stanchions. We have to jump, I shouted, wrapping my other arm tightly around Freya's waist and looking at Dana and Odell to make sure they understood. I'll give the signal. Dana nodded. Odell was struggling to keep her eyes open, but Dana wrapped one arm tightly round her and grasped a stanchion with the other. I lowered myself onto the top step. We'd left Tronal far behind, and there was no land close enough for swimming to be an option. Waves were now washing over my feet. I turned back, almost lost my balance, and nodded to Dana. After three, she gasped. One, two, three, go! We leaped through the air, and hit the silky smooth welcome of the ocean. Stars sparkled all around us as we sank lower, and the blackness below reached up its arms and carried us down. I felt no cold, no pain, no fear, had no sense of the women around me, although I knew they were there. I was filled with a sense of peace, of finality, it wasn't so bad after all, this dying business. Just sinking into silent, velvet-soft darkness. But the will to live is wonderfully tenacious, and I felt my legs moving, making swimming motions. Then the ancient laws of physics kicked in, 
and the air in our jackets began to rise upwards, taking us with it. The surface broke around our faces like shattering glass, and the salty night air leaped into my lungs. I reached out for Dana, found her hand, and thought I saw the glint of her eyes as they met mine. Odell and Freya were just dark shapes in the water. I could hear an engine again, and knew that someone was close. I tried to summon up fury that we'd been through so much, only to be picked up by the second tronal boat, but couldn't do it. I didn't care. The sound of the engine grew loud, almost deafening, but I had no sense of where it was coming from. I looked across at Dana and thought I saw her gazing upwards, a second before we were bathed in light. When I opened my eyes again, I started screaming. Chapter 41 I was in a small, cream-painted room with flower prints on the walls and a door opening onto a private bathroom. I was back on Tronal, chained to a narrow hospital bed. My screams echoed through the building. The door to the corridor slammed open, and a nurse ran in, followed by an orderly and then a young doctor. They clustered round my bed, making soothing noises, trying to settle me back down again. I'd been sitting up. I looked down at my wrists. No shackles encircled them. I tried to move my legs. One of them moved easily. The other was too stiffly wrapped in bandages. No sign of chains. There was another bed in the room, but I couldn't see who was in it. The nurse was standing in the way. The doctor was holding my arm, a syringe in his hand. I tugged free and hit him. He swore and dropped the syringe. No drugs! Don't you dare drug me! I yelled. Sounds like she means it, said a voice I knew. We all turned. Ken Gifford stood in the doorway. The others stepped back, away from the bed, unsure what to do next. Where am I? I said. The Balfour, replied Ken, on Orkney. DCI Rowley and I thought you might all prefer to be off Shetland for a while. Duncan, I gasped, ready to start screaming again. Ken gestured across the room, a small smile on his face. The nurse had moved, and I could see the man in the bed next to my own. Ignoring the pain, I pushed my legs over the side of the bed until I was standing. Ken put an arm round my waist and half-steered, half-carried me to Duncan's bed. My husband's eyes were open, but dull. I didn't think he could see me too well. I reached out to stroke the side of his face. His entire head was bandaged. I didn't take my eyes off him, as Ken and the nurse settled me back down on my own bed. He took a nasty blow to the head, said Ken. We did a CT scan when you all came in this morning. The middle meningeal artery had been ruptured, causing an epidural hematoma. I watched as Duncan's eyes slowly closed. He'd suffered a fairly common form of head injury. The middle meningeal artery runs just above the temple on either side of the head. The skull is thin at this point, making the artery vulnerable to injury. An epidural hematoma, or build-up of blood between the skull and the brain, can compress the delicate brain tissue and, if not treated, lead to brain damage, even death. Will he be okay? I asked. We think so. The blood had time to clot, so he needed a craniotomy, but it was all fairly straightforward. They'll keep him sedated for another twelve hours or so. The younger doctor had picked up the syringe and was hovering. Don't even think about it, I spat at him. He and Ken exchanged a look. Then he left the room. The nurse and the orderly followed and the door closed behind them. Ken sat down on the bed. Dana and the others, they're here? He nodded. 
Dana discharged herself a couple of hours ago. Alison and Colette are still here, both doing fine. For a second, I wasn't with him. Then I had it. Freya and Odell, of course those haven't been their real names. Alison and Colette, I repeated. Tell me about them. You need to rest. No, tell me who they are, I said, trying to push myself up and not managing it. Duncan's eyes were still closed, but the steady rise and fall of his chest was reassuring. Ken got up and propped up the bed. Colette McNeil is thirty-three, he said, sitting down again. She's married with two young children and lives just outside Sombra. Every morning she takes the kids to school and then walks the family dog along the cliff top over on the west coast. A month ago she was doing exactly that when she was approached by some men. Next thing she can remember is waking up on Tronal. The dog found its way home and raised the alarm. Everyone assumed she fell over the cliff. Her family? They know? Ken nodded. Her husband's with her now. And the other one? Alison? Alison was a tourist. Came up here with some friends, but split up from them to explore the islands on her own. She can't remember what happened. She's pretty traumatized, but she was apparently seen getting on the ferry from Fair Isle three weeks ago. No one saw her arrive back in the mainland. She was presumed drowned. They couldn't afford bodies to be found this summer, I said. Ken frowned at me. Stephen Rennie isn't one of them, I explained. He's only been at the hospital a few months. He isn't even from Shetland. They couldn't risk faking a death at the hospital this year. They would all have been accidents with the bodies never recovered. Ken fell silent. We listened to the sounds in the corridor outside, to Duncan's breathing. I guess, he said eventually. Look, that's enough now. He stood up. You need to rest. As he made to leave the room, I felt panic rising again. No drugs, no sedatives, not even painkillers. Promise me, I said. Ken held up both hands. I promise, he said. You're not one of them, are you? They said you're not one of them. Take it easy. No, I'm not one of them. Richard, he's... I'm so sorry. He walked back and took hold of both my hands. Don't be. Between four and five hundred, he said. They're everywhere. They could be in this hospital. Calm down. You're both perfectly safe. I won't leave you. I'm so tired, I said. He nodded and wheeled the bed back down again. Then he bent over and kissed me on the forehead. I managed to smile at him as he sat down in the chair beside me. But it was Duncan's face I was looking at as my eyes slowly closed. Epilogue A skylark had woken us, just as the silvery light of early dawn was beginning to soften and turn gold. Before breakfast, we walked along the cliff tops, watching the waves break on the rocks below, and hordes of seabirds bustle about building nests, preparing for the imminent arrival of parenthood. The day was unseasonably warm for late May. Sea pinks and the tiny, blue, bell-shaped flowers of the spring squill were scattered over the cliffs like confetti. Walking home along the roadside, we could hardly see the grass beneath the thick rug of primroses. Shetland was at its best and most beautiful. And a small army of English police officers was searching our land for the remains of Kirsten Hoyk. Duncan and I sat on the flagged area at the back of the house. Even from a distance we could see they meant business this time. The soil samples they'd taken previously had all tested negative for phosphate. Further analysis on Helen's orders had indicated the samples hadn't come from our land at all. Big surprise! 
so the process had begun again. More samples taken, tested at a different lab, and this time, several positive results. Now our entire field had been divided up into a grid. Meters of tape crisscrossed the length and breadth of it, held in place by tiny metal pegs. The officers, working in teams of three, were systematically checking square after square after square, measuring, probing, digging, paying particular attention to the areas where phosphate had been found. They'd been at it for four hours, and had covered a good quarter of the field. They found nothing so far, but the world's media, who'd been camped on our doorstep for the past week, seemed to have swollen in ranks this morning. A sense of grim expectation hung in the air. Two weeks had passed since our adventures on Tronal. My leg was healing well. Duncan had made a near complete recovery. We'd been incredibly lucky. My detour to Dana's house that night had saved our lives. Helen had instructed one of her constables to collect something she'd left behind there. He found the envelope I'd addressed to Helen, and on her instructions, opened it. Hearing what I was up to, and I'm told cursing non-stop for the following two hours, Helen had sent a dozen officers back to Tronal. They rescued Duncan from the basement and my stolen dinghy from the beach. Helen herself directed the operation from on board a police helicopter, the same one that picked us out of the water after the boat went down. And then the fun really began. Twelve island men, including the staff of the Tronal Clinic, several hospital personnel, dentist McDouglas, D.I. Andy Dunn, and two members of the local police force, are being held in custody on various charges, including murder. Conspiracy to murder, kidnapping, and actual bodily harm, to name just a few. Superintendent Harris of the Northern Constabulary has been suspended from duties, pending an internal inquiry. Duncan tells me that these men are the tip of the iceberg, and I don't doubt him for a second. Of course, believing is one thing; actual hard evidence is proving as elusive as the Trowy folk of legend. These thirteen may be all we ever get. Stephen Gare is still missing. Whether he's alive or dead, we have no idea. We can only hope. Richard's funeral is to be held on Unst tomorrow. We sank that night in relatively shallow water, and the launch with his body on board was easily recovered. Half of Shetland are expected to turn up to honour Richard's memory. But Duncan and I will not be among them. We've talked about it at length, but neither of us can face it. There are still faint bruises around my neck. I can't pretend to grieve for the man who put them there. Neither can I look into the faces of the congregation and wonder. Duncan's motivation is more complex. He is struggling to deal with how close he came to becoming one of them. So Ken will be our proxy tomorrow. We've seen quite a lot of him the last couple of weeks. He's formed a habit of turning up unannounced, usually at meal times. He still flirts disgracefully, but only when Duncan is in the room. Other times he avoids being alone with me, so that problem, at least, has been shelved for the time being. I still haven't got to the bottom of who stole whose girlfriend, and I suspect I never will. I'm not sure either of them really cares any more. It was Ken we discovered, who performed the surgery that removed a clot from Duncan's brain. At the end of the day, I guess, it's difficult to continue hating someone who has saved your life. Besides, they both enjoy bitching about the seemingly endless police investigation. So far, no charges have been brought against either Duncan or Ken. But we don't feel we can breathe easily just yet. The strongest point in Duncan's favour is that when Helen's team raided the island that night, he was found locked in the basement, bleeding profusely from a head wound, and not too far from death. The fact that he didn't set foot on Shetland for nearly twenty years will help too. As far as Ken is concerned, he was conveniently out of the country 
during just about every summer when the female death rate peaked. I think Richard went to great lengths over the years to protect his favourite son. The Tronal Maternity Clinic has closed for good. The two infants I saw that night have been transferred to a neonatal unit in Edinburgh and are both doing well. Their birth mothers will be traced, as will all the women who attended Tronal for a late termination in recent years. What their legal relationship will be to the babies they thought they'd aborted, who can say? Just another of the many unholy messes to come out of Tronal. The land around the clinic is being extensively searched. Some human remains have already been found, but from what I can learn, it's going to be a long job. In one area close to the beach where I landed that night, several tiny skeletons have been unearthed. Of all the babies born at Tronal over the years, these are the ones for whom my heart cries the most, the ones who didn't make it. Colette McNeil and Alison Rogers are both pregnant as a result of their stay on Tronal. No intercourse had taken place. The pregnancies were achieved by doctors opening the women's cervixes and inserting sperm directly into their uterine cavities. Lawyers are currently arguing over whether technically that constitutes rape. Colette is planning a termination. She and her family are leaving Shetland. Alison, a twenty-year-old single girl, is thinking of keeping the baby. I turned at the sound of footsteps on gravel. Dana had made it through the press barricade and was walking towards us. She was wearing jeans and a large shapeless sweater, her hair scraped back in a ponytail. I hadn't seen her since the night we all leaped into the ocean together and she looked smaller and thinner than I remembered. When she reached us, she didn't seem to know what to say. Thought you were in Dundee. On sick leave, I said, because she looked as though she might start crying, and I wasn't sure I could handle that. There had been too many tears over the last couple of weeks. She pulled a wooden folding chair forward and opened it. Supposed to be, she agreed, bored to death. Flew back this morning. She sat down next to me. I think you might be in trouble, said Duncan who was looking towards the top of the field. We both followed his eyeline. Helen, in a white jumpsuit, had stopped bustling about like a mother hen and was staring down at us. I turned back to Dana, risked a smile, saw its pale reflection on her face. How are you feeling? she asked, her eyes dropping to my stomach. Dreadful, I replied, because that was close enough but there really aren't words to describe what a woman goes through in the first trimester. Just as soon as I could talk on the phone without vomiting over it, I was going to contact all my past patients and apologise for not being sufficiently sympathetic. And is that good? No, but it's normal, I said. We fell silent, watching Helen torn between wanting to come down and lay into Dana for coming back to work and needing to stay where she was and get on with the job. All the while I was thinking that the only remotely normal thing about my pregnancy was the little creature at the centre of it. Jenny had scanned me yesterday. Duncan and I had held hands, tears streaming down both our faces, as we watched a shapeless little blob with a very strong heartbeat, totally oblivious to what had been going on around it. And I suppose we're hoping for a girl, said Dana tentatively. I heard Duncan give a soft laugh, and it seemed like a very good sign. A sudden noise grabbed my attention. On the fence that ran the length of the field were a group of pale grey birds with forked tails, black heads and red beaks. They were arctic terns, come back from their long winter in the southern hemisphere, Hoping to nest in our field, as was their usual custom, they were frustrated at the sudden human invasion. 
Terns are not placid birds. They jumped around on the fence, circled overhead, yelling down at the police officers to be off and find somewhere else to dig. Didn't they know this was breeding ground? I think they found something, said Dana. My attention snapped away from the birds. Where? That group near Helen. Tall man with sandy hair, woman with thick-rimmed glasses, near the reed bed. I watched. The small group Dana was talking about was no longer one team among many. It had become the focus of activity up in the field. One by one, other white-clad officers were stepping closer. Oh, they've been doing that for the last hour, said Duncan. I think that team's just more excitable than the rest. They're very close to where I found Melissa, I said, in a voice I wasn't sure would carry. Nobody spoke. Up in the field, four men started digging in earnest. We should go inside, said Duncan. Nobody moved. The digging went on. Activity around the rest of the field had stopped. All eyes were on the four men with spades. Even the turns seemed to have quietened down. Clouds began to roll in from the Vaux. The land, so rich in colour just moments earlier, fell into shadow. No one, either in the field or on the back terrace of the house, seemed able to talk. We listened to the regular thud of spades against damp earth and waited. When I didn't think I could bear it any longer, the digging stopped. The men with spades stepped back and others strode forward. Cameras began clicking, people were talking into radios, equipment was unloaded from the vans parked in our yard, and a surge of excitement ran through the press ranks. Helen started to walk down the hill towards us. The perfectly preserved, peat-stained bodies of four women were eventually found on our land. The first they dug out of the ground that day was Rachel Gibb. The others have since been identified as Heather Patterson, Caitlin Corrigan and Kirsten Hoyk. All were names I knew. I'd seen them on my computer screen the night I met Helen. In the days that followed, I learned more about them, where they'd lived, who they'd been, how they were believed to have died. And I spent more time than was good for me, imagining their final year. Torn from their lives, cut off from everyone they loved, these women had to face the long, painful drudge of pregnancy and the terrifying ordeal of childbirth, alone and in fear. They'd had the best medical attention possible, but no one to hold their hand, give them a reassuring hug, tell them it would all be worth it in the end. Prisoners of their own bodies as much as of the men of Tronal, these women had sat in their pens like pregnant cattle, biding their time until their purpose was served, and they were needed no more. And if thinking of this makes you want to howl with rage, then join the club, my friend. Join the bloody club. Each woman brought out of the earth that week had had her heart cut out, just as Melissa's had been. Each had three runic symbols carved into the flesh of her back, Othila, meaning fertility, Dagaz, the rune for harvest, and Nautis, sacrifice. The search has been called off now, much to my dismay, because I know there must be two more bodies buried somewhere. Seven KT boys were born a year after these women supposedly died. The police team insist, though, that the fields behind our house have been thoroughly searched. Even Duncan and Dana are telling me to leave it now. So these women will stay out there. They may lie in the Shetland earth for all time, along with all the other women who have disappeared without trace on these islands over the centuries. Or they may turn up out of the blue one day when someone, too ignorant to know better, dares to disturb the ground. The terns have found somewhere else to build their nests now. We don't blame them. 
We are going to do the same. Afterward. The stories on which sacrifice is based are documented but not extensively, largely because for many years Shetlanders felt no need to write them down. The remote location of the land kept its population stable and for a long time word of mouth was considered enough. I have learned that there was even a certain reluctance amongst the islanders to talk about these strange and supernatural events. But gradually... Over the years, people from outside the islands became interested, then intrigued, and books about Shetland law began to appear in our bookshops. It was my discovery of the chilling legend of the Coonal Trows in Aylesbury Public Library, of all places, that gave rise to the idea for sacrifice. I wrote this in the English home counties, not venturing north until it was all but complete.